Good evening. At this time, I'd like to call to order the Planning Commission meeting of October 23rd, 2023. For viewers watching at home, some members of the public may be participating via video conference or teleconference. Please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, Jen? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Will the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Ferris? Here. Commissioner Tyler Kettlehut? Here. Commissioner Lanson? Here. Commissioner Link? Here. Chair McMahon? Here. Uh, tonight we have with us Deputy Community Development Director Fabiola Zelaya. Are there any written com comments, announcements, or continuances at this time? Um, no, there's no continuances. Uh, we have a supplemental packet that has been distributed to the commission and posted containing written correspondence related to item 7B that was received after the agenda packet was published, including responses to that correspondence. Thank you. Uh, we will be taking the Jans Marketplace Hotel public hearing first this evening, followed by the Navigation Center public hearing. Um, and do we have any public comments at this time? No. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, and next we have the consent calendar with the minutes of September 25th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting. Are there any comments? Do any of my fellow commissioners have any comments or a motion? Mr. Link? Uh, I, I was hoping that my well wishes to my lovely wife on our anniversary would have made it into the uh, commissioner comments, <laughs> but uh, that notwithstanding, I will move to approve the consent calendar. All right. Okay. Uh, will the secretary please prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Ferris? Yes. Commissioner Tyler Kettlehut? Yes. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? Aye. Chair McMahon? Uh, abstain. Motion carries 4-0, Chair McMahon abstaining. Um, I was not at the meeting, so I think it was the right thing to do. <laughs> okay, uh, so item 7B, uh, will um, the secretary please open the public hearing? 7B hearing having been advertised as required by laws hereby open to consider agenda item 7B, Jan's Marketplace Hotel, Project 2021-70997 Zone Change Z2022-70079 Development Permit DP 2022-70265 Tentative Track Map, map TTM a Special Use Permit SUP 2023-70009 Landscape Plan Check LPC 2023-7006 California Environmental Quality Act CEQA 2022-70002 Environmental Impact Report EIR, that the Planning Commission consider the Environmental Impact Report and Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program prepared in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA 2022-70002, and make a recommendation to the City Council for the following applications for the construction of a hotel, commercial retail space, and associated landscape, hardscape, and grading located at 20... 225 North Moor Park Road. Zone change 2021-70997-Z zone change limited to the footprint of the proposed building from C3 Community Shopping Center to C3H Community Shopping Center height overlay to increase the building's maximum height up to 75 feet. Development permit 2022-70079-DP to allow the demolition of approximately 35,500 square feet of commercial development and construct a new 216 room five story hotel with amenities and approximately 13,000 square feet of commercial retail space including including outdoor dining, hardscape, landscape, and grading with an approximately 38-acre Jans Marketplace in the C3 Community Shopping Center zone as part of the DP, the applicant requests two waivers to the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code to maintain an approximate 35% building and structure coverage above the prescribed 25% building and structure coverage as otherwise required by TOMC Section 9-4.1404B and maintain the existing 2,642 parking spaces below the required 3,767 parking spaces for the existing Jans Marketplace plus the Man Jans Marketplace Hotel project resulting in an approximate 30% parking reduction for the Jans Marketplace as otherwise required by TOMC Section 
1.2402 tentative track map 2022-70265 DTM to subdivide 121.63 acre commercial lot into three parcels to allow the retail component to be sold separately from the hotel component that includes provisions for shared parking, ingress, egress, and amenities, parcel one totaling 20.42 acres, parcel two airspace totaling 0.66 acres, and parcel three airspace totaling 0.49 acres, special use permit SUP 2023-70009 to allow for the sale and consumption of beer, wine, and distilled spirits with food service on the premises within the hotel's 1,780 square foot bar and up to 13,308 square feet of restaurant uses with up to 5,204 square feet of exterior, pat exterior patio space located at 225 North Moore Park Road Assessors parcel numbers 525 0 0 0 0 The applicants are Verdant Thousand Oaks, LLC, Adam Corral Greens Development, and Newmark Merrill Companies. <laughs> well, I'll take a moment to have her catch her breath. <laughs> All right. Uh, presenting on behalf of staff is senior planner Scott Kolwitz. Whenever you're ready. Uh, Chair McMahon, members of the Planning Commission, members of the public, thank you. I'm going to read my presentation to you a little bit slower than Lori did, but I'm still going to try to keep it as brief as possible for the collective whole. Uh, so with that, thank you. We are here tonight to talk about the Jan's Marketplace Hotel Project, which is proposed. Um, I'm joined by a number of city staff members. We'll hear, we're here for you if you have any questions for us. And following my presentation, the applicant will have their own presentation as well. So with that, um, the request before you tonight is, uh, as Lori just read, I'll give the summary version of it, uh, a zone change to, uh, to change the uh, height from C3 to C3H, limited to the Building Footprints Hotel. And what that change really does, it, it allows us to increase the maximum height from 35 feet up to 75 feet total. Uh, this project also includes a tentative track map to subdivide one commercial lot into multiple lots, uh, three all together. Uh, there'd be a ground floor lot um, and then two airspace components above it uh, to allow the retail facilities which are being proposed and 13,000 square feet approximately to be sold off separately from the hotel component itself. Uh, this action uh, would include provisions to retain shared parking, shared uh, egress, ingress into the facilities as well as other amenities and infrastructure. In addition, there is the actual development permit which allows the construction of the structures and specifically we'd be allowing the demolition of the existing 35,500 square foot building. Uh, those of you um, who know the Jan's Marketplace well know that's, uh, that include the former Marshall's uh, structure as well as the uh, units to the north which were previously mm -hmm. occupied by medical facilities. Um, in its place, we would be constructing a five-story hotel uh, consisting of a total of 216 rooms and associated uh, commercial retail space and outdoor dining, uh, associated hardscaping, landscaping, grading, infrastructure, all those things would come along with it. And as part of the development permit, we are seeking uh, two waivers to be approved uh, with the project. Um, one is related to building and structure coverage. Uh, essentially, the, uh, the existing coverage in the Jan's Marketplace today is approximately 35%. Uh, percent. Following this project, we'd be slightly larger than what's there today, but still approximately 35%. And the second uh, waiver that we're looking for is to maintain the existing parking um, as is. Uh, there are uh, 2,642 parking spaces that exist within the Jan's Marketplace today. Uh, by strict application of the municipal code, uh, 3,767 parking spaces would be needed for the whole of the Jan's Marketplace, including the proposed project. Uh, but due to um, shared use agreements, if you will, uh, there's a request to actually reduce that amount of parking uh, down to the existing 26, 000, uh, sorry, 2,642 parking spaces or a 30% parking reduction would be the other way of looking at that. 
Um, as mentioned by Lori, we, there is a request for a special use permit to allow the on-sale sales and consumption of beer, wine, and spirits, both in the hotel's bar, as well as in the retail component that's being proposed, um, as well as in the exterior patio spaces if those are to be constructed in the future. Uh, related to the project, but not before the Planning Commission tonight, is a landscape plan check uh, uh, permit. And effectively, while the, uh, the project plans would be undergoing the construction plan check, staff would be working with our uh, landscape architect and the fire department to make sure that the landscape is consistent with the city's uh, landscaping standards, the forestry master plan, uh, the, um, the State of California Model Water Efficiency Landscape Ordinance, as well as the fire department's regulations. And last but not least, the final component of this project is the environmental impact report that has been prepared for this project. Um, and we will go through those components uh, as we move through this evening. So before I get back to what the project is, we're gonna go ahead and set the stage in terms of what the background of the site is. So uh, the site, uh, prior to any sort of development that was out there, it was, like most of the Thousand Oaks, used for agricultural purposes. Um, if we uh, jump to December of 1959, uh, that's when the Ventura County Planning Commission approved a plan development permit for the Caneo Village Shopping Center. And that has the designation of being the uh, uh, Caneo Valley's very first shopping center, um, or the city's first. Um, the underlying map that went along with that was recorded in 1960. And then between 1965 and 1994, the Caneo Valley, uh, Caneo Village Shopping Center uh, grew, adding department stores, specialty retail, restaurants, uh, offices, and continually modified circulation and parking throughout the entire development. And then in April of 1994, uh, the city council uh, approved a height overlay, major modification, uh, to the plan development permit and a uniform sign program that set the stage for the major renovation for uh, the Caneo uh, Village Shopping Center and transformed it into what we know today as the Jan's Marketplace. Uh, that approval did include a C3H height overlay, similar to what's being requested today, to allow two specific uh, buildings to exceed the 35-foot height limit uh, within the Jan's Marketplace. Um, so that is the existing baseline condition that we have today. And then since 1994, uh, the Jan's Marketplace has continued to evolve, modernizing the buildings uh, to reflect both the tenants' needs as well as the, the community's needs uh, when it comes to uh, commercial uh, 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 desires. Specifically for this project, um, there's a, a series of actions that I wanted to bring you up to speed on as well. So in January of 2022, the City Council uh, initiated a height overlay zone change uh, for this project, specifically to allow a hotel up to 75 feet um, and the author uh, the authorization to concurrently process the associated uh, land use entitlements uh, for this project. Between January and December of 2022, the applicant then submitted the project's formal applications. And as part of that process, uh, city staff started filing our, our required notices. Uh, first, we started off with the environmental impact uh, report portions. We issued a notice of preparation uh, which started a 30-day public review period uh, between February 17th and March 20th of 2023. And that was to solicit information about what should we actually include in the EIR. In addition, we held a scoping meeting for the same purposes on March 1st, 2023 to influence uh, the content of uh, the EIR. Then as part of the project application, we uh, published or, or uh, posted our notice of application and mailed our notice of application notices on March 2nd, as well as August 10th of 2023. We jump forward again on August 11th of 2023, we filed a notice of completion and a notice of availability. Those are two documents related to the EIR. And what those do in effect is it starts a 45 day public review period of the draft EIR. And that ran between August 11th and September 25th. And then in preparation for this meeting, we submitted our uh, planning commission notice of hearing uh, that was published, mailed, and posted on the site on October 6th of 2023. And all of those actions led us up to tonight. 
So as far as the project site itself, um, the Jans Marketplace, um, as we all know, it's at the corner of Hillcrest and Moorpark Road. It consists of approximately 611,000 square feet of development. Uh, that includes a number of different uses, uh, retail establishments, a gym, a movie theater, various restaurants, a four-story parking structure, uh, landscaping throughout the entire center. Uh, but mind you, no landmark trees are, are in the center. Uh, there's a number of common amenities, included shared parking and infrastructure, and collectively all that sits on 38 acres as outlined on the left side of the screen. Uh, the Jans Marketplace is readily accessible from the uh, US 101 and surface streets, and the surface streets provide not only vehicular access, but also access for pedestrians, bicyclists, and bus services. Uh, the project site uh, sits within uh, uh, the C3 zone, and two portions of the site uh, currently have the C3H zone, as previously mentioned, uh, which allow those heights up to 75 feet. Uh, the project site is surrounded by the following uses, and, and the, right, the image on the right side of the screen helps you with this one in terms of zoning. Um, so to the north are various commercial uses, which are all in the C3 zone. To the east are also more con uh, commercial uses and large surface parking lots, again in the C3 zone. To the south, um, we continue through the Jans Marketplace in the C3 zone and large parking lots. And across the street uh, from the Jans Marketplace, across Hillcrest, um, is a property which is in the C3H zone, so allowing that 75 feet again. And if we look to the west, uh, there are a variety of commercial and office uses uh, in the C3 zone, uh, the C3H zone, um, as well as the commercial office zone. Existing development within the Jans Marketplace uh, ranges uh, be, uh, with um, uh, buildings which range between one and four stories. And uh, existing commercial and office buildings in the immediate vicinity, specifically to the west, range between one and five stories. The location of the proposed hotel contains an existing building that we would describe as having a two-story mass, and that's being uh, proposed to be replaced with the five-story structure. So as far as the project goals and objectives, uh, this is what the applicant has shared with us. Um, they uh, wish to enhance the City of Thousand Oaks and the Jans Marketplace by creating an aesthetically pleasing hotel that is compatible with existing adjoining uses to serve the local community. Uh, they propose to revitalize the Jans Marketplace by replacing outdated dormant buildings and structures with fresh modern buildings uh, and design. Uh, we're seeking to provide local employment uh, opportunities with career advancement opportunities. Uh, there's a desire to provide needed overnight and extended stay services to residents, business groups, and tourists within the city. Uh, there's a desire to provide shopping, dining, recreation, uh, and assembly opportunities within the city. Uh, we're seeking to strengthen the city's commercial core by providing quality accommodations for lodging uh, for residents, business groups, and tourists. Uh, there's a desire to create a financially viable hotel uh, that's capable of serving all of these uh, functions and desires and goals. And uh, finally, to provide fiscal and economic benefits to the city um, uh, by adding local amenities to the community. So uh, continue with the project. Um, again, the, the hotel is, is gonna be right in the middle of the shopping center, kind of on the northern edge of the center. And the proposal, again, is a five-story, 216-room hotel um, immediately adjacent to the four-story parking structure. Um, the structure, it would include an open air courtyard, and I'm giving you a little detail here of, of where it's located. Um, so it includes an open air courtyard within the center of the hotel. Um, and that courtyard is com composed of two different levels. On the ground floor is a special events area. The second level includes a pool. The first uh, floor would be split between the hotel and the new uh, retail spaces. Um, and for context as well, as we look at uh, topography, uh, the topography of the Jans Marketplace um, is relatively flat where the proposed hotel is. But if we went from the uh, northwest corner uh, to uh, uh, the northwest corner of the Jans Marketplace as a whole to the intersection of Hillcrest and Sears Drive, um, the site drops by about 40 feet. 
um, and that's over a distance of 1,600 uh, and, uh, feet and a little bit more. And what that means is that there's approximately a 2.5% slope across the project site. But again, where this site itself is being proposed, it's relatively flat. The first floor square footage, um, uh, again, is to be divided between the hotel and the retail space. And the hotel space is just shy of 23,000 square feet. Um, and I'm outlining that in red here on the screen. Um, and this would include both the indoor area and the courtyard area. Uh, the main entrance of the hotel it, with the yellow star is located on the western side of the building, uh, set back from the access road, and a secondary access to the hotel would be on the eastern side of the building, also, um, uh, represented with the other yellow star. Uh, the hotel's first floor itself would include a front desk uh, and hotel management offices. Uh, there would be a sundry store for hotel guests. There would be three meeting rooms, a hotel bar, a commercial kitchen and dining facilities, a fitness room, laundry room, um, as well as a business center. Uh, and the courtyard would also be on the first floor, which is intended to provide uh, space for the special events included in the hotel. Also, uh, on the first floor, we would have the, uh, the retail space, approximately just over uh, 13,000 square feet, and I'm outlining that in blue here on the screen. Uh, and there would be additional patios that potentially could be uh, constructed on the outside of the hotel subject to compliance with fire code and building code provisions. Uh, the retail spaces uh, themselves would be accessible on the north and the east side of the building where the various stars are identified here. And those may change over time as various retail uses would go in and the stores may take just one bay or it may take multiple bays. Um, as mentioned, the hotel and restaurant uh, anticipate to sell alcohol uh, within this development. The hotel's bar I'm highlighting with the little pink box in the bottom left corner of the screen. Um, and then the retail space and those exterior patios, would, we anticipate those to also have alcohol sales. Uh, food service would be required with alcohol sales. And the hours of operation uh, would be limited to the hours of 9 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. each day, um, provided that they also obtain a subsequent license from California Department of State of Alcoholic uh, Beverage uh, Control. And uh, finally, in terms of uh, those sort of operations, uh, unamplified outdoor music um, uh, would be allowed in the outdoor uh, dining areas, so unamplified music but live entertainment um, other than unamplified outdoor music would be prohibited. So looking for basically a mellow environment, if you will. Uh, the remaining floors of the hotel would each be uh, 29,000 square feet would be the base. Uh, they would replicate each other. Uh, the second floor would be slightly different in that it would have the pool deck. So that would increase the size of the second floor by 2,300 square feet. As mentioned, special events are something that we uh, anticipate as part of the hotel. Uh, this would include things like weddings. Um, the special events are considered incidental and accessory to the hotel's use. Um, and as we've written the development permit and analyzed it, um, no additional permits would be needed for the special events provided that the total number of guests as well as staff combined did not exceed 250 persons. So there is a threshold built into how big the events could be. Uh, the special events are subject to noise and security conditions of approval uh, built into the resolutions. And uh, the hotel operator would be required to coordinate all of their events with fire and police and uh, ABC as they uh, propose their various events. Um, special events could include live entertainment, um, but the hotel bar and the restaurants, again, are not permitted to have live entertainment. They would need to go through a subsequent permit entitlement process if that was a desire. Um, and just before the question's even asked, um, the special events were included within the parking analysis for the project. So we're, uh, we're comfortable uh, with the special events as presented here. Um, and I'll eventually talk about parking as we get through the presentation. As far as the project's architectural design, it's a contemporary design. 
And the design object, uh, objective of the project is to provide continuity with the JANS marketplace um, and the surrounding development, um, but yet provide a distinct visual uh, impression of the building, so letting it, letting it basically have its own identity. The building's form uh, has strong horizontal elements and uh, pedestrian scaled geometric forms, which help break up the massing of the structure. Uh, the horizontal and vertical articulation, the re recessed storefronts, uh, and various canopies also provide shadow lines, uh, which further offset the massing. Uh, the hotel's angular architectural elements on the top of the building introduce a playful touch and a, a unique language to this particular building. And the roof cover, it's opened up on the sides uh, to give additional uh, architectural interest without actually increasing uh, the mass of the structure. The exterior walls of the building are earth-toned colors. Uh, they're primarily consisting of off-white, light grays, um, browns, and black. And I'll show uh, with the slide here how this uh, ties in with the Jan's Marketplace. So here we go. Uh, so the overall structure would be composed of a combination of smooth trowel finished stucco, composite wood siding, concrete, porcelain tile, and steel uh, storefront doors and canopies recessed anodized aluminum windows with clear glazing, and wood timber louvers. Uh, these colors and materials, as shown on the screen, are found throughout the entirety of the Jans Marketplace. One thing that I want to point out, because I think this is actually really cool, is the hotel's entrance along the Jans Marketplace uh, pedestrian walkway, so this is on the east side of the building. Um, they played off the thick forms of the uh, pedestrian walkways in the Jans Marketplace today, and utilize that same form on the western, uh, on the hotel's eastern entrance. Uh, so it's a little nod to the existing Jan's Marketplace, but another way of trying to tie it in uh, to the, uh, the broader vision. Um, one other thing that the hotel includes is placeholders for public art, and I'm circling those now. Uh, these are on the building's facade, and this complements the Jan's Marketplace uh, display of art throughout the entirety of the shopping center. So the maximum height of the C3 zone is 35 feet, and compared to the hotel, that's the dashed red line going through the center of the building here in the image on the screen. Uh, conversely, the C3H zone allows a maximum height of 75 feet, and that's the, the solid red line. Uh, the building would have a flat roof with parapet walls, uh, mechanical equipment screen uh, walls, an elevator shaft, enclosed stairways, as well as an architectural element. And I'm going to break down each of those heights for us um, at this point. So the first floor, it's 20 feet tall, and that's the yellow line going across the picture here. The second through the fifth floor would each be 10 feet tall. Um, and that would bring the uh, roof of the building to a height of 60 feet, which is the blue line on the screen. There are two 10-foot mechanical equipment screen walls that are placed 30 feet back from the edge of the building, so it would be difficult to see it as a pedestrian from within the mall. Uh, um, sorry, I, I, mixed, I skipped the parapet. The pink line here is a four-foot parapet, that, so that's 64 feet. And then we hit the uh, mechanical equipment screens, which are a, uh, a maximum height of 70 feet off the ground, and that has the green line. Uh, the decorative architectural element um, is highlighted here in the orange line, and that has a range between 68 feet and 71 feet. And then finally, the tallest portion of the building would, would clock in at 73 feet. That's the purple line on top of the enclosed stairway, which is required for the fire department because they need an enclosed stairway to the rooftop um, for their purposes. As the site is flat, there is no additional height uh, relative to grading. Access to the site would be provided from the existing service road um, that connects Wilbur and Moore Park Road. So again, there's the, uh, the hotel in the middle of the, the property, and there's the existing access road. Uh, a drop-off lane would be provided uh, for the hotel um, on the west side. And in addition, a new fire lane would be constructed north of the hotel. And the fire lane uh, wouldn't be for vehicular travel for anyone else. It would be limited to the fire department with bollards and other things to stop other vehicles from getting in there. Uh, no new parking spaces are proposed as part of the project. 
Uh, parking would be provided utilizing the existing 2,642 parking spaces uh, that are shared between all tenants of the Jans Marketplace. Uh, the Jans Marketplace permits do not restrict parking to any particular tenant. Uh, mm -hmm. So they are first come, first serve um, as, a, as a city permit would, uh, would be processed. While no spaces are actually uh, reserved for any particular use, it is anticipated that the hotel occupants would pri primarily use the parking structure given its proximity to the hotel. Um, the project also includes um, direct pedestrian access, uh, which plays off of the existing circulation patterns within the Jans Marketplace. Some landscaping would be provided primarily in uh, planters on the east, uh, sorry, the west side of the hotel. I'm highlighting them in green, um, as well as pots uh, provi uh, provided in front of the storefronts. Um, a final landscape plan would be processed during plan check, uh, as previously mentioned. Uh, lighting, of course, would be provided, and the lighting effectively consists of various wall mounted recess lights, uh, string lights, uh, emergency lighting uh, throughout the development. Uh, and then the east and west facades um, have uh, recess, and, and the north uh, facade have recess lighting uh, built into it. Uh, but in particular, on the east elevation um, in this graphic, um, the public art could potentially be uh, lit as well with the, the lighting. Um, additionally, signage for the hotel and the retail spaces would be anticipated. That's not before us today. Uh, there would be an, uh, an update to the uniform sign program that's needed, uh, but that would be additional lighting that would be reasonable to expect. And finally, uh, the project would require some grading, but there really isn't significant grading as part of this project. We're looking at uh, approximately 84 cubic yards of cut, 28 cubic yards of fill, and 56 cubic yards of of, um, of export. No soil is anticipated to be imported. Uh, pile driving is not anticipated for this uh, construction either. Um, there would be some pedestrian improvements uh, at the center. So in particular, there's a new crosswalk that's being provided where there currently isn't one. So I'll give you those graphics again here. And um, you know, given the relatively minor um, grading, the proposed drainage pa pattern and runoff really isn't anticipated to change either. However, filtration uh, would be expected to be increased as we move forward. For the, um, the airspace subdivision, I have some graphics here for all of you. So the hotel and the airspace are gonna sit on, on the ground and the proposed retail space is parcel three. I'm highlighting that with the green uh, shape here. Um, that would only occur on the ground floor, and then the hotel, the airspace, would be the next um, several stories above that. Um, those uh, parcels, uh, as we create them, would still maintain the reciprocal access uh, to the rest of the Jans Marketplace, continue to get reciprocal utilities, uh, and participate and have available all the, ac uh, the amenities throughout the Jans Marketplace. Since this project site is located within an existing shopping center, we were concerned about construction and how that would work. So the applicant team has prepared a construction plan, a safety plan in particular, to minimize interruptions to the surrounding businesses, as well as provide safe passage for employees, visitors, um, and the contractors themselves. Uh, temporary protected walkways are anticipated to be uh, installed and construction is expected to last 18 months as this project goes forward. So those are all the physical bits and the operational bits of the project in terms of how does it actually relate to our plans. So we did review this project for consistency with the current general plan and we found that it fit. Um, in particular, it's a commercial use within a commercial area. It has easy access to US 101 and it increases the diversity of uses within the Jans Marketplace um, and promotes the efficient use of land through concentrated development. Not only did we look at the current general plan, but we foreshadowed to December and a little bit beyond, and this project is consistent with the draft 2045 general plan. Um, in particular, the 24, 2045 general plan um, provides a mixed use land use designation on this property. Uh, which allows, um, as it's currently written and uh, recommended, uh, hotels, 
retails and, uh, and restaurant uses. Um, the land use designation also allows for structures up to 75 feet, provided that they get a height overlay uh, zone put on top of it. So this project does uh, snugly fit within that. Uh, the property is also complementary to the Thousand Oaks Economic Development uh, Strategic Plan. And in particular, it implements a mix of, a mix of uses at the Jan's Marketplace um, to help replace the loss of larger department stores um, and big box retailers. And it's a key uh, commercial center, uh, which continues to be a major contributor um, to the city's tax base as we look forward. In the short term, we do expect construction uh, to be uh, a, a boon uh, for economic growth. But in the long term, we expect uh, the transit occupancy tax to be a long uh, sustaining uh, component of our, of our tax base. The project is compliant with all development standards of the C3 zone with the exception of three components, height, building and structure coverage, and off-street parking. Upon approval of the C3H zone, uh, the project would be consistent with height, which would only leave two more components, which would be the building and structure coverage and the off-street off parking requirements, and I'll go ahead and take us all through those at this point. So the project, again, in includes the zone change to increase the height from 35 feet to 75 feet. Um, and so here's the project site right in the middle of the Jans Marketplace at uh, 73 feet. Um, but it's surrounded by other uses which already exceed the 35 foot uh, height maximum. So at 285 North Mark Park, Park Road, that's the building previously occupied by Burlington Coat Factory. Uh, that site, which is directly north of this project site, has a height of 44 feet. Um, the uh, Regal Cinemas across the way in the, in the marketplace um, currently has a height of 40 feet 6 inches. The parking structure is immediately adjacent to the hotel, and that four-story structure um, has a maximum height of 47 feet 9 inches. Uh, and then as we look um, slightly to the west of this project site, the former uh, Exxon Corporational Regional Headquarters um, at uh, 225 West Hillcrest Drive, so across Wilbur, um, has a height of 69 feet 10 inches. There's also another C3H uh, zone property which exists to the south of the Jans Marketplace across from Hillcrest Drive. Um, but to put the numbers in perspective, one of the things that we did is we um, conducted a peer review of photo simulations and line of sight studies. And I want to take us through that uh, so we can see what this building looks like in context. Before I show you the pictures of the project, though, um, on screen, this is a photo of uh, both a commercial of a, of a constructed project and a photo simulation of a particular project that was produced by the same firm that produced the photo simulations for this project. So this is kind of the beta test, if you will. Um, one of these is the constructed version. One of these is the rendered version. And we found that the photo simulation was fairly credible. Uh, not even fairly credible. We found it was, was credible. Um, so uh, we just, uh, uh, there's the answer for you as to which one was the rendering and which one was constructed. Um, we didn't want to just settle for one, so we got a second one. And uh, this, uh, again, uh, we found that these photo simulations were found to be credible for this other project. Uh, again, the same firm created these photo simulations. So jumping forward to this project, uh, there were a total of six different photo simulations that we provided. And um, these were used, used uh, use the same methodologies as the prior photo simulations. Um, as will be seen in the following slides, uh, based on the location of the hotel within the center of the Jans Marketplace, um, which is surrounded by the commercial structures that exist today, the four-story parking uh, structure and landscaping, the hotel is actually really hard to see from the public right-of-way. So taking us through one step at a time, this is a view of the project site from East Hillcrest Drive and Moore Park Road looking north. And the view of the hotel is largely blocked from public view by existing topography, signage, and landscaping. We actually had the developers uh, and the photo simulator team remove the landscaping so you can see what it actually looks like on the right side. 
This is a view of the hotel from Moorpark Road um, uh, looking west. Uh, this is in the center of the site. And an incremental view of the hotel can be seen as you're entering the uh, private property. Um, we do know that you could still see Fireworks Hill uh, to the north of the project even after the hotel is uh, constructed. Uh, this is a view of the project site from North Moore Park Road at uh, Brazil. Uh, uh, and the hotel is really largely blocked from public view by the existing development. If we were on the other side of the property in Wilbur, um, turning into where you would access the parking garage, maybe if you're trying to get to Regal Cinemas, uh, looking east, this is the view you would see. And the parking structure really uh, blocks the view of the hotel. Um, it's really not until you get down the driveway aisle uh, significantly onto the property before you actually see the hotel. And then the final view, this is on Hillcrest uh, Drive and the Caneo Boulevard intersection looking north. And uh, at this intersection, you could, uh, it's, it, you really don't see the hotel either. There's a very uh, small sliver of, of the hotel structure that pops up right in this neck of the woods. Um, so from the public right of way, we really don't see the structure. So with that, staff does support the height overlay request as it would be located in an area uh, that's surrounded by two story and, and five story massings. It's directly uh, adjacent to 285 uh, North Moore Park Road uh, with its four story massing and adjacent to the four story parking structure. Uh, the construction of the new hotel uh, with the five story massing would not create a conflict of scale or intensity of use. And the existing Jan's Marketplace physical development as seen from the public vantage points would be largely unchanged um, when the project is constructed. Um, we did mention the two waivers that are requested. So for the first one, for the building structure uh, and coverage, uh, the Jan's Marketplace today, uh, it, if you add up both the buildings and the structures, it, it's just, uh, it's approximately 35% is the coverage. Of that, 29% is the building coverage, and then the parking structure is the remainder of that 6%. Um, upon demolition of the building, coverage would drop. So when that happens, uh, uh, you remove the 35,500 square feet of development, we drop down to 26% uh, of coverage opposed to 29% of building coverage. But then when we rebuild the structure at 800 square feet larger, um, the building coverage would return to approximately 29,000, uh, sorry, 29%. So it's just a little bit larger, but um, the percentage doesn't change because the overall calculation relative to the 38 acres is, is that small. Um, so staff does support granting the maximum building and structure coverage waiver uh, uh, to maintain an approximately 35% building and structure cover coverage um, above the 25% requirement. Uh, because we feel that this would really be imperceptible uh, to all of us when you're actually experiencing the site on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that is in the context of 611,000 square feet sitting on 38 acres of property. Um, and the creation of the three airspace subdivision parcels would not alter any of those statistics because we look at it from the underlying um, um, uh, property lines. As far as off-street parking, um, required off-street parking is calculated by adding up all the required parking um, uh, for the individual uses, unless a peak uh, hour, um, sorry, unless peak hour parking demands offset from each other. So if you have some uses which are pe uh, peaking during the middle of the day and others that are at the night, those are the sort of uses that are ideal for a shared parking arrangement. And that's what we find with the Jans Marketplace and this project in particular. Uh, the primary reason for a shared parking uh, process is to reduce the number of, sp of parking spaces um, that would be uh, reasonable without providing less than, than is necessary. So we're trying to provide that balance between supply and demand. Um, so through the provision of a parking uh, analysis, um, it's important to uh, study uh, what sort of deficiency would be uh, provided, if any, and, and strike that balance so you don't uh, put parking potentially on um, surrounding streets, if you will, or adjacent properties. So with that, um, we looked at parking conditions and without the hotel project, 
um, a total of thirty uh, three thousand. Sorry, a total of three thousand one hundred and forty six parking spaces would be required under current conditions um, if a shared parking uh, uh, program was not in place. But the Jan's Marketplace does have a shared parking uh, program in place. So rather than provide 3,146 parking spaces today, uh, only 2,642 parking spaces are provided between all the uses throughout the entirety of the Jan's Marketplace. That calculates to a 16% reduction from what's required. The Jan's Marketplace Hotel Project um, is not providing any new parking spaces, and with that, uh, the number of parking spaces that would be required goes up while supply stays the same. So a total of 3,767 parking spaces would be required for the Jan's Marketplace uh, plus the hotel project. Um, and that, uh, if, if the parking... Um, uh, shared parking agreement was not uh, utilized, we'd be looking at um, essentially 30% more parking spaces needed on the project site. Um, in order to understand where the parking exists on the, on the site, um, I am dropping the number of parking spaces per the various zones. And previously, as mentioned, we do anticipate uh, the vast majority of hotel guests will park in the parking structure, and that's actually where the vast number of parking spaces are located. There's just shy of 1,400 parking spaces in the parking structure today. So I mentioned a shared parking analysis was prepared. Uh, both the city's planning division as well as our parking, our traffic division uh, peer reviewed that. Um, we were critical of it. It took a little bit for us to get through it. And ultimately we did agree that the findings supported the parking reduction. In particular, our findings uh, that we wanted to uh, share loud and clear tonight was actual parking usage demand uh, demonstrates that parking occupancy did not exceed 42% of all available parking in current conditions. So looking at it a different way, approximately 60% of the parking lots are vacant uh, in today's uh, use. Um, however, the entirety of the Jans Marketplace isn't occupied today. So we also looked at the Jans Marketplace and projected forward what would happen if we had 100% occupancy uh, for both the tenants and the hotel. Um, and we found that uh, projected demand would be 1,933 parking spaces. That number is less than the 26, uh, sorry, the, two, the 2,642 parking spaces that are available today. And as previously mentioned, the hotel's parking demand is highest in the evening when the parking for the Jans Marketplace is the lowest for the rest of the tenants. So uh, with that, staff does support the parking waiver resulting in that approximately 30% reduction of required parking spaces uh, because we frankly think it'll work. Um, additionally, we have conditioned the parking uh, the project to have a parking management plan. Um, this would establish loading and unloading vehicle spaces uh, for both guests as well as deliveries. Um, we're, uh, the applicant would need to implement a valet parking program for special events uh, just to help manage that. And um, the hotels to include other items to help reduce auto uh, dependencies such as shuttles or auto sharing, uh, bike sharing, ride sharing, um, and other information, if you will, for local transportation um, solutions. We looked at traffic and what sort of impacts traffic would have and um, comparing existing retail uh, trip generations to the proposed project um, and including internal capture credits, um, it's estimated that the proposed project would only generate 41 more trips in the PM peak hours uh, compared to existing uh, conditions. And as the proposed project would generate less than 100 net PM peak hour trips, uh, that, that meant that no, um, a traffic study wasn't required and a VMT analysis was also not required for the proposed project. Um, impacts are assumed to be less than significant and no additional mitigation measures are needed under those conditions. While uh, the project was not required to prepare a traffic impact study though, we did look at LOS standards um, uh, surrounding the project site. And uh, what we found was that the surrounding intersections continue to operate at LOSC or better um, in a post-project uh, condition, and that's consistent with general plan policy. 
So the project in that sense is also consistent with our general plan. Um, and then as we look into the future, the applicant would be required to pay the various traffic fees associated with development uh, to take care of their fair share contributions to traffic improvements as part of the entirety of the city system. Um, I've already talked about the alcohol use permit. I'm not gonna repeat myself. This is just repeating that there is one that's being requested. The police department did an analysis of it and they support it and they have provided operational conditions to help manage that as we move forward. Oh, sorry, there was one graphic on there, so let me share that with you really quick. Um, if you are curious about how close is the closest residential facility to this particular location, that answer is approximately 1,200 feet away. So I'm circling the hotel in white, and that's the closest residential facility. There's not a direct connection. You'd have to walk through buildings or be a crow to fly over them. Um, so the distance is actually longer than the 1,200 feet. In accordance with CEQA, uh, we did a comprehensive evaluation of the project for environmental impact uh, impacts and um, uh, the project's physical development and uses um, and the reasonable and foreseeable uh, operational components of the entire project were evaluated. And what we found was that the project would not have a significant impact on the environment uh, with implementation of mitigation measures. Um, without repeating the dates, we did go through the necessary public review periods, both at the front end through the notice of preparation and the back end through the notice of completion and availability. And through that process, um, we did receive a total of four letters total um, on the back end. Um, two uh, were from agencies that came in during the 45-day public review period. One was from an agency that came in after the 45-day period. And one was from a uh, public commenter that came in on Friday night, um, just a few days ago, that was included in your supplemental packet and staff uh, prepared response to comments to all of those items. Um, and while um, statutorily uh, we are required to respond to items and letters that come in during the 45 day review period, uh, we responded to all of those letters with um, a written response to comments. The end result is um, the uh, environmental analysis that we had remains unchanged um, based on the, the comments received. Um, the agency letters, there were some edits that we had, some, some small technical edits, but the overall impact, uh, the mitigations uh, did not change. Um, Really quick in summary, the mitigation measures that are included in the approval documents, uh, the resolutions in particular, um, have to do with air quality dust suppression, um, various best management practices essentially related to dust, um, architectural coatings, um, there's a mitigation measure regarding that and air quality, um, and diesel off-road equipment, um, so essentially trying to get to a higher tier uh, so uh, to pr protect air quality. There's some biological uh, mitigation measures regarding bat roosting as well as bird nesting and uh, surveys that need to be done to see if, the, if those uh, particular species are on site and if there are uh, construction work is redirected. Um, cultural as well as paleontology um, surveys and monitors are needed uh, while the work is happening. Um, requirements to follow the geotechnical report and um, a verification that it's actually uh, the geotechnical engineers um, recommendations are in fact incorporated in the project is required. Uh, there's abatement proceedings for asbestos, for lead and PCBs, um, for materials that may be on site um, and are, are regulated by various state agencies. And um, there's also um, a mitigation measure just in case any um, unanticipated materials are, are uncovered while we're going through construction. Follow the regulatory measures for that. And finally, the last mitigation measure has to do with solid waste management, uh, preparing the plan to be in, a pla in place during the operation of the facility. So the CEQA findings for the EIR, um, including the response to the comments and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, 
um, are all included in the Planning Commission's packet tonight. Um, and with the um, incorporation of the mitigation measures, again, the project is not, uh, it, it will not have a significant adverse effects on the environment. And staff recommends, the Planning Commission recommends, the City Council certify the environmental impact report in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, Without repeating dates again, we went through the necessary public review periods um, and notification procedures um, pertaining to the local uh, municipal code as well as uh, state code. Um, and we had the one supplemental uh, packet item that we uh, distributed to you today, including the response to comments. So in conclusion. The proposed project has been designed to meet the intent of the existing general plan and the proposed general plan. Um, the various policies and um, uh, of, the, of the economic development strategic plan um, and the city's municipal code. The proposed building uh, and design and site layout we find integrates well with the Jans Marketplace in particular, as well as the surrounding built environment. Um, and the um, this project really helps continue that evolution that we saw since 1994 to evolve the Jans Marketplace to meet current needs and demands. Uh, the building, uh, based on the analysis and the findings contained in this report, staff recommends the Planning Commission makes a recommendation to the Council to certify the EIR uh, written for this project and approve the project and resolutions subject to the conditions of approval included in the resolutions. And with that, uh, staff is here for any questions that the Planning Commission may have for us. So thank you. Thank you. That was very thorough. Very, very nice. Um, do we have any questions? Commissioner Kettlehut? A couple, couple quick questions. So talking about the reduction in parking, and I know as we've been kind of moving through this whole process, we've been identifying sites in the city for mixed use housing. With the reduction in parking, would that burden any future uses if someone determined that they wanted, if the property owner determined that they wanted to actually do that kind of a use on the property? Uh, I'm going to answer that a different way. We would, we don't want to be speculative about what future development may be. Right. So a future development is going to need to carry their own water. Um, if they're, uh, well, I said I don't want to go down the speculative path. Any project that would be um, coming in the future would either need to propose replacement parking, so there's no net loss, if you will, um, and then also provide their own parking and or have their own parking uh, waiver request in the future. And that would be analyzed based on whatever it was that was proposed at that point in time in the future. I have a couple more. Um, you talk about, you said that uh, you anticipated 41 more trips based on, on and, and wouldn't require a study. Can you explain what LOSC or better is for me? I can, but I don't think you want to hear it from a planner. So <laughs> I'm going to ask a public works um, a colleague to come up to the microphone to help explain what LOSC actually means um, technically and pragmatically. Good evening, members of the, the uh, commission. My name is Mike Bueno. I'm with the Traffic Engineering Division. Uh, so um, in regards to level service C, um, there's a range between level service A to level service F. A being free flow traffic, um, very light, um, very little delay, whereas level service F is um, heavy congestion. So um, the general plan has established level service C as an acceptable level of service. Generally, it's that middle ground where um, there's not a high congestion um, in the area. Um, and generally, that's about, uh, it can handle, um, for for example, Wil Wilbur Road can can handle approximately 37,000 vehicles per day based on uh, a two lane um, in each direction. So that kind of gives you that level of service C. When, when it gets closer to there, that's level of service C. When it goes over, it starts being more congested. So uh, we looked at those locations around um, that area, as mentioned in the presentation. Um, based on the existing data we have, uh, the intersections around there are level of service C or better. So um, we don't expect any, um, any unacceptable level of service with the addition of this project at this time. Thank you, that, that helps a lot. Can I ask Thank one you. more? My three? Yes. <laughs> 
And, and, and this may be something, obviously, for the applicant. Do they know or do they anticipate who's going to be operating the hotel at this point? Yeah, we'll uh, defer the specific answer to the applicant, but in terms of a land use matter, we regulate the use, not the brand. So hotel is what we're looking at and gave a conservative uh, analysis based on any operator that may locate into the facility. You're welcome. Commissioner Lanson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr. Kowitz and your team for a very detailed report, and I very much appreciate the graphics uh, to highlight a specific issue. Um, you also did a great job in terms of going through what initially my questions would be. It's almost like you're in my head, which is really creepy. Um, but I do appreciate you going through everything. I did have just, again, a few clarification of issues. So with the amount of uh, people that may be coming from the parking lot to the, the hotel, I think you said there's a crosswalk. Um, are we lighting that in some different way? Are we highlighting it? Are we doing something to, because again, I don't know how many people are going to end up coming through that if it's only one additional crosswalk that may add a lot of people to that. I'm going backwards in the slide to get there, so give me just a second. Um, there wasn't any lighting explicitly that was uh, proposed there. I know there is lighting that's out there uh, visualizing it uh, from visiting the Jones Marketplace at night, um, but I can't specify if there's actually any uh, light standards that are out there today. When the applicant comes up and gives their presentation, we do have members of the Jans Marketplace that are here. Um, we'll ask them to address that particular question. And I wouldn't know whether or not the front of the hotel there would add some additional lighting for purposes of the drop-off. So that was kind of my ultimate question is whether or not there would be more highlighting that to make sure that people had a safe way to cross. Um, and getting back to the parking and kind of taking the, the devil's advocate side is, Say, for instance, that you wanted more parking. I'm trying to understand what could you have required here that actually would have given the, the concept 30% more as an additional parking structure? I mean, what, I mean, that, how would we have satisfied that if it was not acceptable? Again, that, that would have been an interesting conversation with the, uh, the development team, uh, perhaps another structure somewhere else on the property um, or adding to that one. But ultimately, we didn't need to go down that conversation uh, because what we found was that the existing parking essentially uh, provides for the demand. Um, so, And even ultimately, and again, this is my concern, and you, add, you answered the question again being in my head, is that ultimately even with a more uh, dense use, uh, it still would end up coming within parameters uh, according to your calculations? That's correct. Uh, and then lastly, I always kind of look at the uh, comments. I noticed uh, you actually had that as a section. There was a few phone calls uh, aside from the supplement. Uh, it sounds like, again, there's been no other um, written comments with regard to the project. Oh, that's accurate. Since we actually sent out the notification for the hearing, I haven't received any phone calls or emails regarding this project, aside from the one letter that was in the supplemental packet. The initial con um, calls that we received um, were really uh, associated with the notice of application dates, as individuals asked us about height and other things. Um, and we um, engaged in conversation. We asked them to look at the EIR that had been posted online at that point in time, and we did not receive follow-up phone calls um, at that point. The only question, again, I'm not asking you specifically, but I was asked by a teenager after reading this, uh, where is Reign of Terror going to go? So that's not a question we need to answer, but uh, I just want to make sure that's, that's relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ferris. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the comprehensive uh, review of the project, and I appreciate also the back and forth in answering some of my comments during the weekend. Uh, I asked some things about the waiver, so but I just wanted to just double check and make sure the public has an understanding of what we're being asked for tonight. So one, you talked about the, in some ways it's not really a waiver, it's sort of an application of an overlay zone, which would allow for the project to be in there, and you've gone through how that's not really precedent setting in this particular area. We've looked at the line of sight things to see if it's a visual impact. So I've uh, gone, gone down that route, I think. Uh, for the building coverage, m my understanding right now is, at least in the staff report, it's already has needed to have a waiver in order to have the current building coverage. And even if we demolish the current structure, there would still exceed what the code says. So ultimately, we're sort of agreeing to a waiver for the development in order to bring it back to pretty much exactly the state it's in. Is that correct? We would agree with that. Okay. Um, and then the third one deals with a parking. I know each commissioner so far has already talked about parking, but I'll talk about it again. Maybe we can go for the 
full Monty by the by the end of this. Um, in the parking in the parking analysis, it looks like that the parking structure zone one, as it was indicated, is probably the least utilized at this point, and that's where the the number of available parking spaces are available, people can park there, and probably with the location of where the hotel is, might be more utilized by this particular use. Is that, that correct? Yes, we would agree with that. And just reinforcing what Commissioner Lanson said, I think that we did actual reviews of parking at the site, scaled them up to account for if the vacant uh, sites were actually starting to be utilized, and even with that and the new development, we have plenty of spaces according to the analysis, is that right? That is all correct. We okay. actually have a surplus still, even after 100% occupancy. Okay, um, and speaking of that, that's actually a good segue to the next thing. You mentioned it was in the staff report, but sort of this is the project and its use and what is uh, contemplated to be allowed under the new 2045 general plan land use. It, this fits well within it. There would be no need, there, no inconsistencies of this project with what's contemplated there, right? That is correct. And uh, so, in the in the mixed use uh, uh, land use designation, there's a floor area ratio, which had in, been indicated of a 1.0, and for this particular 38 acre property, that could be up to 1.655 million square feet. Whereas right now we're at like 611. Was that what you said? That's correct. And with the hotel, we're only at 720. Is that, is that right? That's so the approximate number, yes. The math itself, like we're like below 0.5 floor area ratio right now. Is that, that's is that, correct. Okay. Um, the only last question I had was about the signage. And I know that the conditions of approval state is going to be consistent with an amended, an updated uniform sign plan. Like we're going to go and update the the uniform sign plan and then the project's gonna be consistent with that as well as the codes. Is there, the the mock-ups that we see on here sort of have on-site on signage which is truly like building identification type that when you're on the complex you'll be able to tell where the hotel is and not as much of being able to see the sign from the limited lines of sight that we would would have from the the renderings is that is that going to be more consistent with what we're seeing here or is that still kind of up in the air so the sign program itself hasn't formally been uh, submitted to us so we think that the signs that are proposed um, probably hit the spirit of what's likely to be coming in but these might not actually be the signs that we ultimately get um, okay. The uniform sign program, we would evaluate whatever is being proposed at that point in time relative to our regulations. Um, if that doesn't get submitted, then there's no signage on the building uh, because the current sign program does not anticipate this building or this signage. So we would have to go through our regular process to uh, evaluate it. But in terms of what's reasonable uh, and foreseeable, um, we think that the uh, the signage that's being proposed makes sense here, and we would go through that evaluation when that, that formal application actually gets submitted to us. Okay, I appreciate the questions, thank you. Commissioner Link, did you have some questions? Come back to me, please. Are there any, any other questions? Okay, um, my questions were all answered, um, except I was just kind of curious about what our transit occupancy tax rate is in the city? That I don't know as a planner. Um, <laughs> let let us uh, give us a, a moment here to try to figure that one out. It, yeah, I, it's not relevant. I was just curious. Um, Chair, I believe it's 10%. 10%. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Link. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first, uh, my apologies if I, um, between Friday and today, I didn't manage to get through the entire EIR, so uh, some of this is going to be review for some folks. But uh, I was curious with regard to the trip generation, and, and I'm seeing the methodology for how we arrived at the net of 41 trips. Did we assume that the, tra the shopping center was fully occupied based on that net difference or just the existing occupancy of the shopping center? 
uh, the uh, existing trip reduction is just based on what was being removed. So the, the net is based on the hotel um, plus the new retail going in and subtracting the trip um, trips from the existing commercial to be removed, which is that, uh, I believe, 35,000 or so square feet. So, um, and then uh, taking into account also internal capture, uh, there was a reduction for that based on the interaction between the hotel and those, those existing land uses uh, within the shopping center. And were, were traffic counts taken as part of this effort or were they previously collected traffic count data? Uh, there was no uh, traffic study or VMT study required, so uh, there was no new traffic counts conducted. Those level of service Cs um, for those intersections that were mentioned previously were from um, previous data we had already. So we assume that we gave full trip credits for an unoccupied space in essence and then calculated the net difference between the proposed trip generation and the existing. Can you um, repeat that, please? So we assume that the existing 35,000 square foot space was occupied, allowed that as a trip credit against the new project, and then calculated the difference based on internal capture. Uh, correct. I would not have been that generous. Because um, that assumes that those trips are existing within the traffic stream, and then adding a net difference of 41, uh, if the shopping center or that space has been empty for X amount of years, uh, then those trips are not in the traffic stream. So all the trips as part of the project would then be new trips, less internal capture, et cetera. Pass by if there is any, but probably not for anything other than the restaurant. Uh, understood. Uh, we base it off of uh, if there is new tenants that could be um, occupying that 35,000 square feet. Um, so we, we did take that reduction into account and uh, that's how we came up with the analysis. Understood. Uh, I think you're probably going to find that your level of service C is going to be a little bit different if we're looking at it from that angle. Um, and then uh, just uh, for my, my fellow commissioners, level of service C is midway between capacity and free flow. So level of service E is capacity. So, uh, okay, thank you, appreciate it. Are there any other questions of staff? Okay. Um, next, we'll call up the applicant, and um, uh, please uh, state your name and city of residence, and all of you in total will have 15 minutes. Is anybody going to talk? <laughs> and I will be your clicker, so just tell me when to, uh, to proceed. I'll have the clicker or no, I, I will be your clicker. You're going to do it for me. Okay, here we go. Oh, I got it right here. This is cool. Look at that. Advanced technology. I like it. Good evening, uh, respected uh, planning commission, city staff, and members of the council. Thank you for having us here this evening. My name is Atman Kadakia. I'm the managing principal at Greens. We're based in Irvine, California. And we have nearly a little over 20 hotels open and in operation. And we have several more in construction in various markets throughout the Southwest. We're excited to develop this hotel here in Thousand Oaks in the Jans Marketplace. Uh, Commissioner Kettlehut, you asked who the operator would be. We are the operator of the hotel. We not only develop the hotel, uh, but we also do operate the hotel. And that's one of the things that makes us a little bit unique. Uh, we're very, uh, we, we very rarely, excuse me, sell our properties. And so we're very highly invested in things that affect the backbone of the project, such as parking, traffic, circulation, access. And ultimately, we take great pride in the quality of our products. Uh, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on at Greens is we don't like to do what I call paper projects, where they look pretty on paper, we spend a ton of time, ton of energy, ton of money designing them, and ultimately they don't work. Uh, we've never had a project that we were unable to get financed uh, in the hotel space. So we've been able to construct all of the hotels that uh, we have embarked on, and we uh, uh, expect to do the same here in the Jans Marketplace. It's been great working with Newmark Merrill and their entire team. They've been outstanding in our mutual efforts to design this project that we can all be proud of. 
I also want to take a moment here to thank the city staff, especially Scott Kolwitz, uh, for all of their hard work on this project. Uh, and commend the city manager and the whole city team for having the vision to support a project like the one we are proposing, which will not only revitalize the Jans marketplace, but also serve the needs of thousands of residents, visitors, and businesses of Thousand Oaks. This area is very special to me, just uh, as my wife is uh, from Thousand Oaks, just off of Ventu Park. And so we have come to the Jans Marketplace many times over the years, well before I ever had any idea that we'd be proposing to develop a project here. Uh, so I very much consider myself a local. We're proposing a Homewood Suites by Hilton, which is an extended stay hotel within the Hilton family. All of our rooms will have full kitchens along with high quality finishes. The hotel is designed to serve the needs of many businesses and families in the area, including those visiting loved ones at the nearby Los Robles Medical Center or displaced from their home during a fire, flood, or simply just in between homes. We also expect our hotel guests to shop and dine in the Jans Marketplace and, and believe that we will help improve the performance of all businesses within the center. We expect the hotel to bring in over $2 million a year directly to the city's general fund, which the city can then utilize to provide other community benefits and services. Councilman, uh, excuse me, um, Commissioner uh, McMohan, you had asked about the TOT, and I do believe it is 10%. There is an additional 2% which goes back to a tourism fund that I believe the chamber oversees and manages to then help market uh, Thousand Oaks, and they can clarify that, uh, but that's my understanding. Currently, there's a severe lack of extended stay hotels here in Thousand Oaks. Uh, most of the business from our analysis escapes to nearby Westlake Village or goes north to Camarillo. We're confident that the proposed Hilton branded Homewood Suites will not only help bring some of that business back, but also help support new businesses as the city of Thousand Oaks continues to grow, particularly in the areas of technology and pharmaceuticals. I have a few slides to share here and some renderings of our proposed hotel. I know you've seen a lot of the exterior, but we also have a little bit of the interior that we would like to share. Uh, much of this is in concept form, uh, but nevertheless, we'd like to share some of this. Um, so this, uh, uh, if you go back one slide for me, Scott, thank you, sorry about that. This is uh, the rendering of the hotel drop-off and a view from the parking garage. Uh, as you can see, there's retail on the ground floor and all of the guest rooms are strategically placed above the ground floor. I think there was a great comment uh, about lighting uh, regarding uh, tr uh, between the structure and the hotel. The hotel will be very well lit and your note about lighting, we will take that to heart. I think we can look at perhaps uh, making sure that we have some sort of light uh, directed towards that area. We'll have to work with the city staff, of course, and the, you know, within the conforms of the building code to address that. Um, next slide, please. This is uh, probably my favorite view. Uh, this is from the interior of the Jans Marketplace. Uh, and, you know, this is a true mixed-use project. Uh, ground floor retail, hotels on the upper floors. Next slide, please. Uh, you guys have seen this view in uh, Scott's presentation, but this is a view of the interior depicting our central courtyard where we can host a variety of indoor and outdoor events. Uh, next slide. This is another view of the interior courtyard. Next slide. Uh, a lot of text on this slide, so I'll try to summarize, uh, probably too hard to read. The Homewood Suites brand is a upscale, all-suite, residential-style extended-stay hotel. It's a leader in the hospitality industry. It competes head-to-head -head in the industry with Residence Inn by Marriott. Residence Inn by Marriott is in Westlake Village. Uh, as you guys know, there's also another Residence Inn by Marriott that is down, or excuse me, up in Camarillo. So we would be positioned really central to both of those and closest to uh, nearby demand drivers uh, that we have here within Thousand Oaks. Um, 
this, uh, this slide here depicts uh, the different types of business guests that we have. We have business travelers, we have leisure groups, uh, and we have those who are displaced and relocating. Next slide, please. Uh, the public space has a variety of gathering spaces, including a central hub and what we call the backyard. Uh, the entire public space places emphasis on celebrating nat natural light, and we try to have as many views to the outdoor as possible, including a variety of seating types for everyone. Next slide, please. This is imagery of the design principles of the hotel, just to exemplify the design quality. Next slide. The lobby has a nice floor height, which really creates a sense of space with large windows and an immediate connection to the backyard. The space feels larger than it is, much like uh, this uh, auditorium here. Next slide, please. Uh, the backyard is the outdoor area, which is multifunctional. It can host events, it can host outdoor gatherings, but it can also just be a recreational space for longer ex extended stay guests. Many times out here, you'll find things like foosball, outdoor foosball, outdoor ping pong, uh, and, and other activities of the sort uh, to really make the space feel like home. Next slide. Uh, we will have amenity spaces within the center. We'll have a mail and package room. We'll have guest laundry, and we'll also have a small sundry shop to buy daily essential items if guests forgot something. Next slide. We also have a high quality fitness center with a variety of amenities for the hotel guests to use. For guests who want a more robust fitness experience, we do intend to work with the Gold's Gym within the Jans Marketplace to offer short term memberships, day passes, which longer term guests can purchase. Uh, Looks like we lost a few slides, but I can still just kind of run through this in concept. We will also have a staff bar to enhance the public space activation. And uh, we have some slides of the actual hotel rooms itself and what they look like. Um, we'll give Scott here a minute to pull it up. Uh, but in the meantime, I can describe them. All of the rooms will have a full-size refrigerator, they'll have a microwave, they'll have a two-burner electric stovetop, um, and they will also have, uh, most of our rooms will have a sofa sleeper. This here is an efficiency studio. So this room is only 350 square feet, but it has a full kitchenette, it has the king bed, it has a multifunctional desk, as you can see, which can be used to eat at, work at, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have storage, of course, and we have a sofa lounge chase. Next slide, please. This is a floor plan of it. Again, a little bit difficult to see, uh, but as you walk in, you can see how the corridor is utilized not only for the galley kitchen as well as the work desk area, it also leads into the bathroom. The bathroom strategically has a door that uh, separates the private areas within the bathroom to the common area within the bathroom, so two people can utilize the bathroom at the same time. Uh, you, of course, have the bed, uh, and the bed looks out uh, uh, of the window. You also have a TV on a swivel mount, so you could sit on the couch, watch TV. You could also, of course, sit in your bed and watch TV. This is our efficiency studio. If we go to the next slide, you will see uh, another angle of the efficiency studio. Please continue. This is another angle of that same efficiency studio. You see the backlit mirror, uh, and really uh, a modern theme to a uh, extended stay experience. Next slide. This is our studio suite. This provides more flexibility of space and enough room for the entire family to settle in. This is probably my favorite floor plan. It has a sofa bed, has an island, has a full kitchen offering. Next slide, please. Uh, you can see as you walk in, you walk into an island with two uh, multifunction uh, stools that can be used. You can work out of that. You can sit more traditionally like an island within a great room kitchen. Uh, you have the same kitchen. You notice how the hallway is multifunctional in the space. Again, driving efficiency. Uh, the, the unit, I have it on the slide. I'm going to look at this really. 
426 feet. It's kind of incredible to think that we have that much packed in uh, to 426 square feet. Uh, but that's what makes hospitality and hospitality design so valuable. Uh, next slide, you can see some renderings of that. Uh, the TV is placed in a way where two people can sit on the sofa, someone else can sit on the bed, everyone's looking in the same direction as the television. These are all small details, uh, but they really impact guest experience when they're within the space, uh, especially when they're staying there for an extended duration of time. Next slide, please. Uh, another angle looking out from the kitchen at that same room. Next slide. Uh, this is some general imagery of our central hub, banquette seating, lounge seating, work table. Next slide. Uh, this is another imagery of our suite shop and front desk. Next slide. Just some more imagery for you. Design intent. Next slide. This is a view of our fitness center and our la la laundry lounge. Uh, you note we have a banquette, we have some sitting areas, so you could do your laundry. Uh, you could also, uh, a guest could also, uh, you know, be on their laptop uh, and or, you know, hang out, read in a comfortable setting while their laundry is being done, uh, which is just one of the more upscale modern features you find in more uh, hospitality, residential style hospitality. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, the design intent of the units, also the corridor. You see pretty much uh, uh, you know, a, a more upscale feel. You'll have wallpaper, textured wallpaper, uh, lighting at all of the door drops. Uh, there's a certain lumen count that we have to hit, uh, foot candles within the interior spaces per the brand requirements. Uh, and really, uh, we design to our, to our market. There's a bare minimum that we have to design to, and then there's what's right for the market. Uh, we believe that uh, we need to have a superior product to uh, the Camarillo hotels, to the Westlake Village hotels, and the Agora Hill hotel, Agora Hills hotels, excuse me, for that matter. Uh, and that's what we intend to do. So part of our exercise when we get into the design development of the space, our design team will actually go physically tour our, all of those hotels. Uh, we actually like that our operations staff spend some nights and spend some time in the different hotels. And by really understanding the market, not only just from our level, as development, uh, but also through operations, also through design. I think it ultimately helps us develop a hotel which uh, will, will succeed, which will be able to compete, right? Which ultimately is the, is the key, is we have to be able to make the hotel uh, work. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we stand by here uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, if we didn't address them already, I have uh, our architecture team on the phone. We have our engineer, we have our vice president of development, Adam Corral, and uh, of course city staff as well. So please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you again for having us up here today. And it was a pleasure working with your staff over the last, uh, what is it now, two years or so, uh, or, or longer maybe on this project. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Hang on a minute. I think we'll probably have some questions. Sure. No? Commissioner Lanson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Kadaki, for going through those slides, and uh, we'll have to make sure Mr. Kolwitz has a better Vanna White presentation next time to uh, keep up. Yeah, with seriously. You. Yeah. Uh, that was not good. I, um, just a few questions. Um, this is the customary one I usually ask: uh, Are are you agreeable with all the terms and conditions provided by the staff in the in the report? Yes, we are. Thank you. And and then more of a general concept she asked in terms of you operating. Um, that is Commissioner Kella. Um what are you looking at in terms of timing? We're obviously dealing with a weird economy. We're dealing with really different interest rates. What are you looking at in terms of timing? Yeah, you know, you bring up uh, some, some realities of the world we're in today, and obviously we can't... Uh uh, really predict the, the future as it relates to where the world is headed. Uh, as, as of now, uh, it's clear there is a severe lack uh, of, uh, of, of hospitality. Uh, uh, I think after this, we have uh, city council, uh, uh, if we are successful tonight, uh, and if we're successful at city council, uh, we will then uh, work in earnest on our building drawings. Uh, it typically takes us about six months to fully develop uh, on a hotel of this uh, caliber uh, the design drawings. Typically, our experience is it's about three to three to four months through the plan check process. So uh, we hope to be in the in the ground by late next year. 
uh, and we expect the hotel to be a 18-month uh, build. So if all goes well, we should be open in June of 2026. Of course, there's many ifs, but we, uh, we want to do our best to meet the timeline. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any other questions? Commissioner Link? So uh, you were saying that you are an operator. I assume this isn't your first extended stay hotel? That's correct. Okay. So just out of curiosity, what's the average length of stay? Average, it actually works out to about four nights, and that might be surprising. Um, it, you would think that it's much longer. Uh, there are some that are much longer, but a lot of guests who are transient as well uh, look at extended stay as just a very nice offering. For example, a family coming in uh, with, uh, with children, uh, they love the extended stay product, even if they're here for two nights. Business travelers are here on a short stay, two or three nights. Uh, it's actually very rare. It's an interesting stat. It's very rare that guests actually cook in an extended stay hotel, much like uh, a luxury pool amenity in a high-end apartment building. It's nice to know you have it. Uh, it's very rare that it actually gets used. Uh, the stats that we have uh, learned from Hilton are that only 7% of hotel guests actually cook in the hotel room, but they want to know that they have the amenities, they want to know they have the pots, the pans, uh, and all of the, the, the various things in the room, the utensils, if you will. Uh, what they really want to do is they want to be able to bring back leftovers, and instead of eating it out of a styrofoam plate, they want to be able to put it on a glass plate, put it in a microwave. They want to have a dishwasher to, to wash the dishes. Uh, there's a perception of cleanliness that comes from a coffee mug that you know uh, has probably gone through a dishwasher because a dishwasher is right there versus uh, what we've seen on uh, TV uh, in the, I don't know if you guys have seen that some horror documentaries where, uh, you know, housekeepers use Windex on mugs and it's just like, what is going on here, right? So uh, there's a perception of cleanliness, there's a perception of, of uh, which, which there really is cleanliness, right? And, and, and there's also a perception of it. So a lot of transient guests do stay within an extended stay hotel, so the average length of stay from our experience is four nights. It could be different, of course, in this market, uh, and every market is a little bit different. Thank you. So uh, is there a possibility then that in the intervening two years that this project could change and obviously probably wouldn't require coming back to this commission or even city council would be an administrative action, but that this would change from that product to a not extended stay hotel? Uh, you know, it, it's possible. Um, as Scott described, you know, it is, it is a hotel uh, that we are uh, entitling, uh, and so it's the land use of, of a hotel. Uh, that being said, uh, we're under a license agreement with Hilton to operate and develop a Homewood Suites by Hilton. We would not be able to terminate the brand with Hilton without liquidation damages, so we are, we are under contract for that. Uh, so we have some obligations to do that. Uh, they've done an initial uh, review of the project in depth, uh, and they've reviewed uh, the design. We've gone through various things. That being said, uh, there is also another round that we have to go through with Hilton. There may be minor tweaks that they come back with, some of the latest and greatest, if you will. Uh, little things, right? Like, you know, they may come back and say, hey, your kitchen is slightly too large. You can maybe make it 10 feet smaller. You can use this equipment. Things change and they evolve. Obviously, we've been working on this for uh, two years plus now. Uh, but uh, as far as the brands and as far as the product itself, it's highly unlikely that us as Greens would change uh, the project uh, at, at any time in any significant way. Thank you. Um, so where I'm kind of going with this line of questioning is that I'm sure you're aware as part of the general plan update uh, that we looked at this specifically, the shopping center, and identified it as a location for residential. So uh, I, I wonder whether this is a product, uh, and then just thinking out loud, that this is a product that maybe doesn't address that need and is almost competitive rather than complementary to the existing, like the hotel in, includes a, res, a, a restaurant component and it, there isn't a component or a restaurant component there currently. So now you're competing with all the other restaurants in the Chance Marketplace. So is this still a complementary type of a product? Uh, yeah, we, we do believe it is. You know, we've worked extensively in conjunction with Newmark Merrill, who are the managers of the shopping center. They were very, uh, very cautious to make sure that the product we bring is complementary and not combative. Uh, the restaurant functions that we have in a Homewood Suites primarily consist of a complimentary breakfast in the morning. You know, your uh, 
sausage, bacon, eggs, toast, tea, coffee, juice, pastries, muffins, danishes, that kind of thing. Uh, as far as a full course meal, we really aren't set up for that. We don't have the staffing for that. We don't have the expertise in that. It's really more of a, um, an amenity, if you will, to the hotel guests, but we really invite them and urge them to go out and shop and dine. Many of our customers are corporate customers as well, uh, as what we anticipate in this location. Corporate customers typically have a spend account, depending on their company that they work for, 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars a day. They very rarely want to get stuck eating hotel food. Uh, they typically want to go out, especially a hotel like ours, where we don't have the expertise to really create that type of culinary experience. Uh, and so we believe that by bringing the guests in, they would be very complimentary to the shopping center because we do expect our guests to walk and go eat at some of the restaurants that are within the facilities. Uh, hope that answers your question. Yep, thank you. Uh, and then one last chairman. Mm -hmm. um, the EIR addresses a reduced density project. Uh, is your development still viable with that reduced density project? You know, I, um, I'll invite Adam Corral up on our team if you may have some insight on that. Um, I'm not fully versed on the technical details of that. Uh, maybe Adam, you know, and if not, we can defer it to Scott or someone at the city staff. Good evening. Um, so I, I think what you're alluding to is, could you take a floor off and still operate if, efficiently, if efficiently? And the answer to that would be, um, we've looked at it, studied it in depth, and with the amount of revenue that we need to generate to make this a viable product, it would not be feasible for us to take a floor off from a reduced density standpoint. So thank you. Are there any other questions, Commissioner? I have a softball question, but following up on what Commissioner Ling said. So you're talking about, he was talking about compatible uses. You, you're going to have a retail component as part of this. And now, I would imagine you are choosing those tenants? Uh, I am not. You are not. So that will be done through Newmark Merrill? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I have a couple questions. It's kind of my thing. Um, you will have bike storage there? We do have a, we do have a bike uh, parking area, that's correct. Have you considered um, secure e-bike storage with plugins? Uh, I don't believe we have. Is that But that's, that's an interesting idea. I think today's guest, they may be wanting that. And I would actually also encourage you to maybe connect up with a vendor that rents e-bikes. I think that would be an amenity that your residents, your guests would really appreciate. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very interesting point. We'll certainly uh, we'll certainly look at that. You know, I uh, I grew up in the era of uh, bicycling without the uh, without the boost. Uh, but when I take my son to go play basketball in the morning, uh, we see kids just zipping by like crazy. I think it's called Super Seventy Three now. Uh, is there is there a scooter of choice, electric bike, if you will? Uh, it's nuts. They go like thirty five miles an hour. Uh, I don't know if you've seen those, but um, I, I think that's uh, uh, neither here nor there. But I think for the guests, I do think that's an interesting, uh, it's a simple thing to add, right, from our standpoint, just a matter of design and putting in conduit and some power. So I think it's a great idea, and we can certainly consider that if there's no other impacts to our project uh, from that. Thank you. Good answer. Um, okay, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you so much. And now we'll go to public comments. Thank you. And um, let's see. We have seven, some on Zoom and some in, in person. We'll take the in-person comments first. And so each uh, speaker will have four minutes. And first we have, um, wait. let's see. First we have Parth Shah. And when you come to the podium, please state your name and city of residence. And we have a total of eight speakers again. We do have eight again. You, the person who dropped out rejoined. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you for letting me speak. So my name is uh, Parth Shah. Took a few notes here for myself as I was listening to uh, the presentation. Um, so I'm a 10-year full-time resident and uh, homeowner here in Thousand Oaks. Uh, I spent also an additional five years 
as a guest for work and student purposes. And uh, so I have a total of 15 years being in the community. Uh, so the first thing I'd love to do is uh, <coughs> thanking all the folks here uh, who are serving the city, uh, because I know that your thoughtful approach to the city planning has made uh, my family and community's quality of life that much better. So thank you first for that. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, and I say this as, uh, you know, when I first moved to Thousand Oaks, despite uh, um, my <coughs> optimistic uh, um, uh, approach to the city, I was actually diagnosed with an oak tree allergy. So uh, I stayed here despite that, so I really do love the city. Um, but uh, in all seriousness, um, for additional context on uh, why I'm here, uh, my wife and I were uh, officially married here in the city. We had both of our children here at Los Robles Medical Center, um, and now we are both working for the largest, one of the largest employers in the city in biotechnology, as I'm sure you all know. Um, now, to be clear, I come here as a resident uh, of the city and someone privileged to work in the city, uh, hire in the city, and lead teams that reside both in the city as well as uh, come in for significant periods of time. So I, I think about this genuinely as a, as a resident of the city. Now, on the subject of this, uh, this project uh, by the, the developer here on the hotel, I, I thought about it in a few different ways. Um, but first, I'd offer up my perspective from a family point of view um, that I, I think the, the Jans marketplace is in need of some beautification. I take my family there, and while I love it, I think it is in need of some upgrades. And uh, <clears throat> some value-added services would be very much appreciated, and sp specifically for visiting family members from out of state and out of city, I think that would be a very good use of that uh, particular space. Now, um, secondly, as someone who hires in the city uh, from a relatively national and international talent pool, uh, I can tell you that uh, many of the talent that we bring into the city that we want to interview, we actually appreciate quite a bit at my employer and the teams when this, the, the, those individuals can actually stay in the city and, and get a sense for a longitudinal stay. Are they a fit for the city and are they fit for us? So I think there's a real value add of us as a city getting to know folks that want to come and join the community. So um, many, many times, um, we've had individuals come that are not able to stay in the city currently. And I think it's very important that the individuals that we bring into the community have a chance to live for a period of time in the city um, as they're looking for work, interviewing, as they're looking for uh, potential employment. And I think um, those individuals have often had to go to other places outside of the city, and I, I think that is not a good two-way street. Um, and finally, I will say, as a team leader in the biotech industry um, and, and someone who talks to many of my colleagues and neighboring employers in the city and emerging employers in the city, um, I see a frequent need for third-party organizations to be in the city for business, for training meetings, and now, uh, more recently, an emerging trend uh, for remote staff that have actually left Thousand Oaks um, and left California who need to come back for frequent periods of time to stay connected to both Thousand Oaks and the employers in the community. So that's an emerging trend that I've seen that those individuals often have to come in and many people in my, in my team actually have to come in. Um, and, and currently a lot of those folks stay in Camarillo. Um, and I would love for them to actually be able to uh, uh, stay in the city. So looks like that's my time. Um, appreciate uh, you all listening to me um, and appreciate all the work you all do here for the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, but from a personal and professional standpoint, I would love to uh, um, see another value added service in that Jans Marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Danielle Borja. And you know what to do. I do. Good evening, Chair McMahon and Planning Commissioners. Danielle Borgia, President and CEO of the Greater Conejo Valley Chamber and also a Thousand Oaks resident. And as a Thousand Oaks resident, um, for basically my entire life, I can tell you that I've seen the Jans Marketplace go through a number of shifts and changes. And I think in the last five years, Newmark Merrill has really re-envisioned this property um, they've brought in some really popular retail tenants, Ulta Beauty, Five Below, if you have kids, um, new eateries in California Fish Grill, in Starbucks, um, Wingstop, 
Uh, but I think one of the most important things that they've done is really focused on experiences. We're living in a time of you know, people that want to um, have different experiences in their community, whether they're residents here or they're visiting. And so they have um, Dave and Buster's, they have Sky Zone, they have ax throwing. Um, so I just encourage you to think about you as a guest staying at this hotel at the Jens Marketplace and all the things that you have at your fingertips. Um, I think that that 7% might go up a little bit since they have Aldi right on site. Um, that might encourage people to go get some groceries and get some things that they might have to have on hand. But then the other side of that is there's so many dining options. And not only at the Jan's Marketplace itself for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but also all the surrounding businesses. You just had Amy's drive through open up across the street. Um, you have the new Nashville Chicken Place. There's so many things that are walkable. And if we're trying to get people to um, encourage pedestrian friendly travel. I think that being in the heart of Thousand Oaks in this project is a wonderful way to do that. The other thing is we talk about in a post-COVID era a lot about um, you know, repurposing retail and office space for best and highest use. And I think that this development and this vision is such a great example of that. You will have um, retail that'll stay intact on the bottom story, but it'll be you know, a refurbished building. And then you're gonna add a use of a hotel right on top of that, um, right in front of an existing parking structure. So I feel like the height is really, when you saw in the renderings, it's not gonna be obtrusive from you know, any of your sight lines of the major intersections. You have over 40 existing tenants that you're going to have over 200 people probably a day built in customers for them. You're going to boost the inventory of the extended stay that they've talked so much about. Um, also, they have some small meeting space, which I think our businesses will really appreciate. And um, I just think that this is a great project. I think it's a slam dunk, and I really hope that you will support it. And um, the chamber and our board of directors are in strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Joshua Gray. Please state your name and city of residence. Thank you, Chair McMahon and commissioners. My name is Josh Gray. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Tourism for the Greater Conejo Valley Chamber of Commerce, although I reside in Simi Valley. I also serve as the Director of Operations of the Conejo Valley Tourism Improvement District and speak to you this evening in that capacity. Our tourism district works to increase the occupancy of the 15 hotels in the cities of Thousand Oaks and Agora Hills. We have developed the Visit Conejo Valley brand and market our community to potential travelers in the Southern California region to increase overnight stays in local hotels. Those overnight stays generate, <coughs> excuse me, generate tax revenue for the city and create a lot of jobs. I'm speaking tonight in support of item 7B for the construction of a hotel and commercial retail space at Jan's Marketplace. The city of Thousand Oaks needs more hotels. The most recent hotel in the city, the Hampton Inn and Suites, opened in 2009. We haven't built a new hotel in Thousand Oaks in 14 years. In August 2019, prior to COVID, our district reported an occupancy rate of 84% for the month of August. That's pretty much the maximum capacity. To get an 84% average occupancy, you need to have a sellout, 100% of weekend rooms for leisure travelers, and a 100% sellout of midweek rooms for business travelers. The only open days left are Wednesdays and Sundays, which are impossible to sell by themselves. In August of 2022, last year, we reported an occupancy of 78%, and this August, we reported 82.4% occupancy and have fundamentally returned to pre-COVID max capacity. Last year, before the City Council, we, we reported it wouldn't be more than one or two years to recover to the occupancy highs of 2019. It took less than one year to return to full capacity during our peak summer season. Hotel capacity has not increased. Hotel rates have been substantially increasing and will continue to, to going forward unless there's action on the issue before you tonight. This trend over time not only hurts our local hotels, but the overall local economy that benefits from the influx of more consumers. 
Please approve this item before you tonight to meet continually increasing demand of travelers and the supply of our local hospitality industry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time we'll turn to our um, Zoom uh, uh, speakers. And the first one is Ethan Yi. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm speaking in favor of building a new hotel. Uh, I'm one of the owners at John Chi Korean Barbecue. We've been at Jan's Marketplace for about nine years now. Uh, new Mark Mellor has been tremendous for us, uh, and we love being there. Uh, we've seen tremendous change uh, since the beginning. Uh, many new businesses have moved in and uh, a hotel would be great for us. Uh, I'm also a business owner in Camarillo. Uh, when we bring in people, <clears throat> excuse me, when we bring in employees from the East Coast, uh, we have trouble finding hotels for them. And uh, it would be great to have another option. So uh, uh, A brand new hotel would uh, increase our availability of choices. And so um, I'm speaking in favor of building a new hotel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Evangelina Young. Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Evangelina Young. I live in Simi Valley, California. I've lived there um, in California my entire life. I am the director of operations for Gold's Gym in SoCal. We have our gym there, which we opened in 2003. So we have just celebrated our 20th anniversary there at Jan's Marketplace. Um, we are calling in support of the hotel we feel that it would really draw and increase the foot traffic and the customer base um, that I think will benefit all the retailers there as well as the residents that surround that area. I know that I personally have frequented Jan's Mall and just walk all around that place and will spend the entire afternoon. And I know that with all of the increased retailers that uh, Newmark Merrill has brought in and will continue to bring in that there is nothing but an upside uh, to having um, the hotel there. Um, we, of course, are looking forward to working um, with the hotel, um, but we as well have uh, just under 25 locations. Um, we do feel that having the hotel there and bringing in the future retailers is going to bring a bit of an upscale um, that we have had the uh, privilege of working with in some of our other locations. Um, Newmark Merrill has been supportive of our business, very supportive through COVID. As you know, all health um, and fitness clubs were hit really hard. So it's taken us some time to get back on our feet. We really feel that this is gonna make the difference, uh, again, not just for us, but for all of the retailers that are surrounding us in the Jans Marketplace, as well as the surrounding community. So we are definitely in favor of this hotel and we hope that uh, they succeed in getting up and running by 2026. Thank you. Next we have Chelsea Banos. Is Chelsea there? Please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, um, my name is Chelsea Banos, and like Evangelina, um, I have the privilege of working for Gold Gym SoCal. Um, I'm our Vice President of Operations and Retention. 
And um, as I think Evangelina hit it in the head, um, we are definitely in favor of this. Um, I am born and raised in California, Calabasas primarily, um, but I have grown up going to the Jan's Marketplace and um, just spent a lot of time there over the years. And I've been, um, you know, with our company for the last 10 years and kind of in and out of it for about 15. So I um, definitely know my way around there. And I think, you know, a hotel would only bring um, just more volume to the mall, more awareness. And overall, um, I think the mall is already starting to transform. So it'll definitely just add um, more to the community and all of us for our business and just, you know, another amazing place to go and more people to have awareness of all of our businesses and everything we have to offer. So definitely in favor. Thank you very much. Next, we have Alejandro Perez. How's everybody, how's everybody doing tonight? My name is Alejandro Perez. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, Newberry Park, and um, uh, I'm a member of the Southwest Mountain States Regional Council of Carpenters. I live in the local area, work and, rec and recreate in the vic vicinity of the project. Um, a lot of people are talking about how it would uh, affect, you know, future jobs and, and um, uh, businesses. Um, not only while the while the business is running, but you know during the construction of the business, this is 18 months. That's that's a, a good while for somebody's career uh, to be working on the project. Um, I believe that we should uh, you know uh, require local hire, uh, uh, skilled and trained workforce to build this project, and uh, you know get get some people working in the area that that can pump this. Uh, Money back into the, the you know the the the, uh, the money going into the community. Um, I've been a carpenter for going on twenty three years. Uh, I love the Thousand Oaks area, and I think that this hotel would bring a lot more money into the area and uh, uh, visitors. And, and, and uh, I can't stress enough how how much uh, of a good presentation the the owners had. Um, this this sorely needed for that uh, that mall is you know with Amazon things like that coming in, uh, the, these kind of malls are are kind of dying out. But this would bring residents, Mighty Axe, all the sushi places, uh, uh, you know, all the little businesses, the uh, um, uh, just all the businesses in that small mall would get revitalized, and you'd get families on the weekends and during the week and. Uh, just want to uh, emphasize on local hire and skilled to train workforce on these projects, especially this one. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And now we have Paul Singh. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, representing my brother, who is a restaurant, owns a restaurant in Jan's Marketplace. Uh, it's called my restaurant, and he's been um, established for 13 years. And um, we really in support of this hotel coming in. It's going to really boost our foundation, as uh, everybody's experienced. Last past three, four years been tough. This uh, hotel coming in, James Marketplace, will um, enhance the area surrounding, bring customers to the businesses overall and uh, take over the unused occupied space, which has been vacant for a while. And overall, I think it's gonna really help our business and uh, make us stronger and increase foot traffic for the businesses, and especially in Jan's Marketplace. So that's, I'm in support of a hotel coming in. Thank you. And that's all the speakers we have on this uh, agenda item. And I want to uh, say for the record, we have one written statement card that is in support of the project. And um, let's see. Uh, now we go back to staff for follow up comments. Commissioners? Oh, excuse me. Staff, do you have anything for us? 
Uh, Chair McMahon, we don't have any follow-up comments uh, based on the comments that we were just provided. Okay, and um, the applicant has five minutes if they have any rebuttal comments that you'd like to make. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have your, your microphone on. Okay, yeah, uh, no rebuttal comments. Just once, once again, thank you all for taking into consideration all of the factors here and really appreciate your time. And once again, a big thank you to staff. All right, thank you. Um, I will close the public meeting at this time and open up the floor for discussion and or a motion. Commissioner Ferris. Thank you. Um, this is a very high quality and well conditioned project. Uh, I really want to commend the applicant and city staff for the work that they've put in to put this together and present it tonight. I think uh, in, we, we get a lot of these things with uh, environmental impact reports and lots of conditions and um, we review these things in detail and I cannot find anything that uh, we'd want to end up either changing or anything else. I think this is uh, really, really nicely done. Um, and uh, there are waivers that we need to process. They, based upon the, the conditions of it, appear to be well justified. I'm, as many of you know, I'm not necessarily a height guy uh, when it comes to buildings. Um, but for this particular area, uh, the Jans Marketplace, in which there has already been precedent to say this is a commercial core uh, for where we can have a little bit taller buildings. They're put into the center of the, um, of the complex. It's, it's the place where, uh, if there is to be urban re revitalization, this is the place in the city that I think is the, the, the best able to, to handle that. And this this is an area that I do think we should be looking forward as to how we can continue the vibrancy uh, of these these very strong and, and vital commercial cores. Um, this is probably one of the it's one of the first and one of the most important commercial cores we've had in this city. I know that uh, Mr. Kalwitz had have kind of provided some of the history. Uh, about this. Turns out after the city had incorporated and agreed to become a city in 1964, it was almost within about six weeks that the city council moved forward with annexation number one, which was this area, to bring it into the city. Um, it, it's, it's one of the areas that, that has become really part of the, the longstanding history of, of, of Thousand Oaks. And the nature of when the last major renovation happened, which was in the 1990s, that was when there was a lot of, we're gonna do department stores, we're gonna do big box retailers, that's gonna be where it is, and it, things have changed since then. And so we're moving away from department stores and big box retailers. This is a, a, a great use that I think in, in the place where it's gonna be will help to revitalize the marketplace, which benefits residents, the nature of this particular use, by having um, quality hotel uh, hospitality uh, uh, services within the city helps benefit our industries uh, for people coming in and having meetings and meeting with the, with the people doing business here in Thousand Oaks. Uh, and I think, I think it's a really, really good project and it's in the right direction, I think, for where we wanna be as a city. And if it is okay, uh, Madam Chair, I'd be open to putting a motion on the floor. Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I move that the Planning Commission adopt resolutions based on the findings and subject to the conditions contained therein recommending that the City Council certify the final environmental impact report, CEQA 2022-70002, and mitigation monitoring and reporting program in accordance with CEQA, adopt a res an ordinance approving a zone change, 2021-70997-Z, Adopt a resolution approving a development permit, 2022-70079-DP, and tentative track map, 2022-70265-TTM, and adopt a resolution approving a special use permit, SUP-2023-70009. Thank you. Are there any comments by the commissioners? 
Commissioner Lanson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I will support the motion. Um, briefly, one speaker pointed out, I think we are in a situation in which we have to adapt. Um, early in our city's career, we were more of a goods-based economy. If you've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. Uh, we changed to a service-based economy in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when malls were great. Uh, we're now in an experience-based economy where people end up wanting to live and shop and spend a day. And I think Newark Merrill has tried very hard to kind of make that work. Uh, they've been very creative in that. And to the applicant, thank you for investing in our city. Uh, it was a great presentation. Again, I want to thank the staff for everything. But again, this is, this is an adaptive process, and I think it's fantastic. Uh, Commissioner Link did make a good point with regard to the fact we're trying to find housing. I think that was originally what we thought might go there. But again, we don't pick that. So I think at the end of the day, uh, this is a great, you know, strategic repurposing of property. I mean, look, it was a Marshalls. It's now being used as a, a great place for kids. But again, it has to adapt into something that is productive for the city, productive for the community. And again, for that reason, I'll, I'll support the motion. Are there any other commission comments? Commissioner Link? Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to be the odd man out on this one. And I realize that uh, in this experience-based economy that we can't have a reign of terror in, in this space for uh, all 12 months of the year. So uh, that's certainly not going to happen. Uh, the issue that I have, and I don't deny that uh, there is a level of revitalization occurring and that this certainly fits that bill. The issue I have is with the traffic analysis. Uh, the, uh, again, this being my job and my stock and trade, the fact that this was an analyzed as being a replacement for an existing space that would be occupied for 12 months of the year assumes that those trips currently exist and they don't. And because the city's threshold for analyzing VMT and satisfaction of CEQA is based on peak hour trips, and uh, me not agreeing with how that analysis was done means that I don't agree that the EIR was done properly. So in that case, I can't support it. I would support the project otherwise, uh, which is why I actually asked about the reduced density alternative, because that would then put you below that threshold, because I think that lops off 50, 50 rooms from the hotel, which would get your trip generation well below that threshold. Uh, but as it stands, is the project as proposed or ex and existing, or the way the project is currently proposed would surpass that threshold in, in my professional opinion, so I just can't support it. Commissioner Kettlehart? I'm going to support the motion, and I'm going to agree with, I'm not going to repeat what you guys have said, but Mr. Shaw made a very salient point that as employers are coming in here, they want their employees to be able to soak on the city. And I think this is a very important thing that you're doing an extended stay hotel so those employees can, can soak on the city and determine if this is really a good fit for them. So, so I'll support the motion for all of those reasons. Thank you. I will also support the motion. I think it's a beautiful project. And I think um, the fact that many of the other tenants are supportive of it is a good sign. And I do think it's a very complimentary to what we need and what we already have. So uh, that being said, um, will the secretary please prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Ferris? Yes. Commissioner Tyler Kettlehut? Yes. Commissioner Lanson? Aye. Commissioner Link? No. Chair McMahon? Yes. Motion carries 4-1, Commissioner Link dissenting. So this is a recommendation to city council, so there is no appeal period. It is essentially, if you want to appeal, you go to the city council meeting. And at that, we are ready for um, item 7A. Do we want to take a quick break? Okay, let's take a quick break. Thank you, all of you who are waiting for 7A. I appreciate that.
Okay. At this time, I'd like to resume our meeting, and I apologize to people who have been waiting here for a very long time. Um, we're ready for um, item 7A. Will the clerk please open the public hearing? 7A, 7A hearing having been advertised as required by laws hereby open to consider agenda item 7A, Navigation Center Special Use Permit SUP 2023-70013, that the Planning Commission finds that the project is categorically exempt from the provisions of the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA Class 32 in fill, pursuant to Section 15332, and a statutory statutorily exempt under government code section 65660B low barrier navigation centers use by right and that the planning commission approve special use permit 2023-70013 to allow the construction and operation of a navigation center for up to 50 units, support facilities and supportive services and associated landscape, hardscape and grading to be developed in two phases. Phase one is 30 units and phase two is 20 units on a portion of a 6.46 acre property in the Rancho Caneo specific plan SP7 area within the industrial park M1 zone located at 1205 Lawrence Drive, assessor's parcel number APN 667-0-080-105. The applicant is Dignity Moves, Many Mansions, and Hope the Mission. Thank you. Presenting on behalf of uh, the staff is Senior Planner Scott Kolwitz. Well, uh, Commissioner McMahon and members of the Planning Commission, members of the public, thank you for having us here on this doubleheader. Uh, I'll try to move through this presentation uh, with uh, diligence and detail, um, but maybe a little bit quicker than the last one. So uh, with that, thank you, Lori, for reading that into the record. Um, just so the Planning Commission knows, we are joined by a number of city staff members. Um, if you have any questions for us, and following my presentation, the applicant will have their own presentation as well. Uh, as Lori just read, we're here for two things tonight, uh, to find the project uh, categorically exempt as well as st uh, statutorily exempt uh, from CEQA, um, as well as to approve the Navigation Center as we shall describe it tonight. I'm sorry this got hung up for just a quick second. There we go. Uh, so the project location, uh, the site is located at 1205 Lawrence Drive in our industrial area. Um, it is on a city owned uh, piece of property that's approximately 900 feet uh, southwest of the intersection of Lawrence Drive and Corporate Center Drive. Um, the subject property, it's a, an awkwardly shaped, almost six and a half acre property, um, but the navigation center would only use approximately one acre of property, the part that actually fronts onto Lawrence Drive itself. Um, this property has been very heavily disturbed over the years, um, and it's mostly undeveloped. Uh, the project site itself, uh, the existing development that's out there today, there's an existing access driveway that cuts across it that goes to the far western edge of it where there's a battery storage facility on approximately uh, 0.2 acres of land. And there are some Southern California Edison transmission lines that are on the northern uh, portion that cut across the center of it and a couple of drainage features, if you will. Uh, the project site is located in the Rancho Caneo specific plan area, and it's surrounded essentially by uh, sorry, industrial uh, development on all sides, um, and uh, some commercial areas kind of sprinkled in the industrial area. On the west side of the property, uh, there is some open space uh, that's managed by Costco, and uh, further to the west of the project, there is a low, re a low density residential uh, development, um, but it's a, a good distance away from this particular project. As we look at the various land use designations and zones that surround the property, uh, the image on the right essentially shows that it's uh, a mixture of the light gray is the industrial land use designation, the blue is institutional, and then the green is uh, open space areas. So the property um, in, in the kind of the, re uh, if I zoom out a little bit and look at the, the industrial area, we've circled the, uh, the site in the red oval here. It's approximately 0.75 miles from uh, Highway 101. 
And the nearest transit stops are identified here with the, uh, the yellow stars. Uh, one is on Lawrence Drive and the other is on Corporate Center Drive. Both of those locations um, get bus service that connects this project uh, site directly to um, Newberry Park, Hillcrest Drive, Westlake Boulevard, and the uh, Thousand Oaks Transit Center within town. And then if you look at it a little bit more regionally, those same bus stops can take people to and from uh, Moore Park and Simi Valley as well. Uh, another, in terms of other infrastructure, uh, Rancho Caneo Boulevard has a class two bicycle uh, lane on it, uh, but Lawrence Drive currently does not. Uh, the project site, uh, as recently as mentioned, is immediately adjacent to some open space that's managed by the Caneo Open Space Conservation Air Agency, or COSCA. And the nearest public park uh, with regular park facilities is the Rancho Caneo Park. And I've highlighted those two open spaces with the green stars on the slide. Uh, the entire parcel, if we looked at it as a whole, has very varied topography. Uh, there's a, a, a hill that rises quite significantly just off the site uh, to the northwest. However, the portion of the property where the navigation center would be developed is relatively flat um, from the uh, Lawrence Drive frontage back to the rear portion of the navigation center site. Um, it's a distance of approximately 500 feet long and raises by a total of eight feet in height, which means that there's only a 1.6% slope. Uh, the stormwater channels, again, are on the, uh, the south side of it, and then there's a drainage feature along the northern property line in the context of the uh, red oval on the project, on the screen here. The project site itself um, has been intermittently used by the city's public works uh, department for construct construction staging over the years. Uh, the parcel, if we take a step back in the 1990s, had been graded uh, and with the idea of uh, building uh, pads for future development, uh, but clearly none of that took off and we have the site that we do today. Uh, the most recent uh, development that's occurred is an industrial development uh, in December of 2019. That's when the battery storage facility was approved and that currently is operational on the western edge of the property. If I jump forward into uh, kind of legislative actions and considerations and policy uh, matters, um, in 2018, the city council approved a resolution that a shelter crisis existed within the city. And since that point in time, we've been really actively striving to find a location uh, to, uh, to solve some of those issues. In 2001, council adopted a priority to identify uh, and advance solutions for emergency sheltering um, and permanent supportive housing. In 2022, council took some specific actions as it relates to this project. Uh, they approved the use of the city owned property uh, that we're talking about tonight for a future use as a navigation center. Uh, City Council authorized staff to release a request for proposal and qualifications uh, for a developer and operator team uh, uh, to both construct and operate a navigation center. The City Council adopted a resolution declaring 1205 Lawrence Drive as exempt surplus land pursuant to the Surplus Lands Act and authorized the mayor to sign a letter uh, to the County of Ventura requesting financial assistance to, to support um, the associated capital and operating costs associated with the Navigation Center. At the very end of 2022, uh, City Council unanimously selected dig Dignity Moves, uh, Hope the Mission, and many mansions to develop, lease, and operate a Navigation Center and to initiate the preparation of an exclusive negotiating agreement uh, for this project. And a few months later, in February 2023, Council adopted the ENA for the development and operation of the Navigation Center at this particular location with those entities I just mentioned. Uh, two months after that, uh, City Council approved a fee waiver for all city planning, building, and impact fees with the exception of wastewater connection fees to help really make this project a reality. And then as we jumped forward, um, we had great news in August of 2023 when the city, counts, when the city was awarded a $5.8 million grant uh, from the state of California's encampment resolution grant for the navigation center. And 
that was really exciting news uh, for us, but it also introduced a time limitation. And the time limitation that we received was uh, the grant requires the city to spend no less than 50% of those funds by June 30th of 2024. As we start talking about the project, uh, the project itself consists of a, of a service-enriched emergency shelter, um, which we think is better described as a navigation center as it helps navigate individuals out of homelessness and into permanent housing. Uh, the establishment of a navigation center within the city of Thousand Oaks will serve the city in three very important ways. First, the center will provide immediate uh, interim housing for residents who are experiencing homelessness. Second, its on-site support and housing navigation services will assist each person in either preparing to return to stable traditional housing or transition into permanent supportive housing based on their own unique individual circumstances and needs. And third, it will enhance the city's enforcement capabilities to preserve both public safety and environmental quality. The intent of the Navigation Center is to build up to 50 transitional housing units and associated support services and facilities, uh, which are crucial uh, to uh, turn lives around, really, when it comes right down to it. The proposed Navigation Center will not be a drop-in shelter. Uh, instead, persons experiencing homelessness will be selected on a referral basis uh, from local service providers, uh, various county agencies, and or by law, law enforcement. Uh, based on those abo above um, descriptors that I just shared with you, those characteristics, uh, this project does qualify as a low barrier navigation center under the government code, um, as it provides a housing first, low barrier, service enriched shelter, which is focused on moving people into permanent housing and providing temporary living facilities while case managers connect individuals uh, experiencing homelessness to uh, income, public benefits, health services, shelters, and ultimately their own housing. Uh, the Navigation Center, uh, we, I did describe this as a two-phase project. So the initial phase, we anticipate developing up to 27 units on it uh, to accommodate 30 residents and a second round to expand to 45 units to accommodate the 50 residents. The Navigation Center uh, is to include various amenities, including but not limited to community gathering spaces, uh, indoor kennels within uh, individual units for uh, pets, uh, meal preparation facilities, uh, which are primarily uh, meals that are being dropped off rather than a full-on kitchen cooking facilities on site, uh, restrooms, showers, and laundry facilities on site, medical and clinical offices on site, check-in facilities to help uh, bring folks in as well as check them out as they're going out and about in the community. Staff offices and break rooms, uh, storage enclosures for personal effects, um, a waste enclosure uh, for reg regular trash and, and refuse and recycling, um, a security system with uh, gates and fencing, um, as well as a minimum of uh, 14 vehicle parking spaces, which meets our code requirements. Um, and in addition to that, um, uh, bicycle parking, eventually up for 24 uh, uh, bicycle parking spaces on site. Uh, the front of the site nearest Lawrence Drive is anticipated to have parking facilities for staff and service providers, um, such as you know, shuttle services and, and those type of amenities. Um, and the check-in building uh, for purposes of security as well as privacy for the occupants. Further into the site, uh, indoor and outdoor community gathering areas are proposed. Uh, the indoor community gathering facility will include an area to receive food delivery services and include an area uh, uh, for some preparation. Additionally, the indoor community gathering facility would include an area for dining um, and gathering during inclement weather. Outdoor gathering areas will also include chairs and tables and shade for dining purposes and just casually hanging out. And there's also a pet uh, relief area that's identified on the project plans. Um, the site, it's anticipated to be uh, lit like a residential uh, development. And I'm bringing that up at this point in time because we're really looking at that indoor-outdoor sort of um, um, design for this project and making the most of the outdoor rooms that are created based on the placement of the fixed, uh, of the, the buildings. 
Um, and the, the lights that are anticipated uh, would be a combination of wall-mounted lights, string lights, uh, emergency lighting, uh, but really intended to give it a residential feel. Uh, and these lights as well, they're not intended to uh, really spill over onto adjacent properties. It's really kind of keeping the navigation center and this particular part of the property lit, but not really extending beyond that. The proposed buildings, uh, we would describe them as simple utilitarian modular structures, uh, which are really built with durable goods uh, and materials and really meant to blend in with the industrial vernacular of the, uh, the Rancho Caneo area. Uh, these uh, units would fit within the urbanized area and the, uh, the industrial buildings around here uh, generally are, are one-story buildings. Some have mezzanines in them, but there's also support facilities that some of them have outside. And, and these, uh, the, these units, we think, just uh, fit in spatially um, and in terms of massing with the immediate vicinity. Uh, while the buildings are simple in form, uh, the architect has arranged those structures, as I said, to create those outdoor rooms. And the project really does create a sense of place that's uh, unified, we feel it's attractive, um, we feel it's dignified, and provides a place uh, of belonging for participa participants as they travel down their own personal adventure and journey towards uh, permanent housing. Uh, this project was reviewed uh, for and found to be consistent with the city's architectural guidelines, so we feel like it really is checking all the right boxes in that sense. Um, the site today, as seen in the earlier pictures, it really is devoid of, of landscaping. And um, there are no currently protected trees on the site. Um, so, uh, but as we look forward, we are looking to introduce landscaping into the site, again, trying to make it feel as, is, as, a, as a residential uh, development, yet one that fits within the context of the industrial site. Um, there is a conceptual landscape plan that has been submitted to us and um, we feel it does a good job of illustrating what's intended out here. Um, but as we move forward with plan check, we will go through our normal landscape plan check process to make sure that it's consistent with not only the city's regulations, but fire's regulations, as well as the state's regulations in terms of um, uh, irrigation systems and, and whatnot. Um, so I'm gonna start diving a little bit into the operations here, but I wanted to, to take a second to talk about you know, interim housing and what does that actually mean? So uh, more closely, um, this is what it looks like when someone processes um, uh, through a center like this um, as we move from unsheltered homeless, homelessness to permanent housing. First and foremost, clients are identified through outreach by our local uh, service providers and county agencies. Second, they're referred to us uh, for interim housing. Third, the client rece receives case management as well as navigation services, and ultimately they're connected to permanent housing. So those are really the four large steps. Um, and I'm gonna dive a little bit more into uh, the operations at this point. Um, so the city ultimately, we are not going to be the operator of this facility. We're partnering with uh, Dignity Moves, Hope the Mission, and many mansions to develop and operate the Navigation Center. And collectively, what we can say is that they demonstrate experience and ex, uh, ex expertise and experience uh, designing, constructing, and operating these type of facilities. Um, and they've done so successfully. They have a track record to prove it. Um, and you'll hear from them uh, shortly about those experiences. Um, the operators are here tonight to discuss details of their operations. Uh, I'm gonna give the high level overview um, at this point in time uh, with just enough detail to, to you know, get you thirsty for their message, uh, but then I'm gonna look for them to actually give you the full cup of water. Uh, so in particular, uh, the participants are to be taken in on a referral basis from the county's continuum of care uh, or from the sh sheriff's department. A priority will be given for Thousand Oaks residents. Um, Walk-in participants are not to be ex uh, accepted into this facility which means that we're not expecting there to be a line outside of the, the facility. Um, individuals um, who would not be eligible for uh, a placement in this facility include uh, those that are registered sex offenders, those that have active felony warrants, um, um, and those, um, or a slightly different way, alcohol and drug con uh, alcohol and drug consumption or possession is not allowed within this facility. 
Upon entering the navigation center, each participant would be assigned to a housing navigator and case manager. And those might be two people, it might be the same person. Uh, part participants will receive individualized support intended to lead to housing stability. And the timing of each individual's journey will be different depending on their individual circumstances. Uh, progress and engagement towards housing goals must be regularly documented and reviewed for the participant to be eligible for um, any type of extensions on their stays. Um, and the average, and on average, uh, the Ventura County Continuum of Care success rate um, is moving participants into permanent housing in about 180 days. Um, it's, we wish it was faster, but there's um, only so much available housing that's out there. So we're, we're struggling against some of those realities of, of housing that's out there. And our applicant teams uh, will be able to talk to about that a little bit more if you have questions about that. Um, the Navigation Center will provide site supervision, meals, supportive services, um, and expected maintenance uh, needs for the facility. The goal is to provide as many services on-site as possible and directly to participants, although sometimes services will need to hit, occur off-site. The Navigation Center has a bed reservation policy. Um, and that requires participants to follow specific procedures to ensure that their bed is maintained and reserved for them. There will be limitations placed upon a participant's arriving and departing uh, timeframes from the Navigation Center, and participants will be required to work with shelter staff on coordinating transportation to off-site locations. Um, in terms of staffing, a minimum of one staff member is required for each 15 uh, participants in the Navigation Center. And the operator is also required to have 24-hour security measures on site, including but not limited to uh, the physical things, the fencing and cameras and security systems, um, as well as um, patrol of the facility and implementation of a good neighbor policy uh, which sets forth minimum guidelines aimed at supporting an amicable relationship between the Navigation Center and the surrounding community and properties. Um, and finally, the project will include or does include a management operations and public safety policies and procedures manual, uh, which is specifically tailored to the city's uh, unique conditions with respect to our uh, homeless population. Uh, the operation plan will be an evolving document um, uh, with the ability for the city to be the one to make changes as our needs change, as we discover things over, over time. The Navigation Center um, is consistent with our general plan. Um, it's a, uh, as a development and the operation of the Navigation Center provides housing navigation services coordinated with a coalition of government agencies uh, to assist homeless persons to return to stable traditional housing or transition into permanent supportive housing, as well as to enhance the city's enforcement capabilities uh, to preserve public safety and environmental quality. Aside from that broad uh, policy directive, additionally, the Navigation Center project is consistent with the general plan's social policy, which states, the city shall serve as a catalyst to encourage the provision of necessary social services within the community. It's also consistent with a very broad residential policy to strive to provide a balanced range of adequate housing for Thousand Oaks planning area residents in a variety of locations for all individuals, regardless of age, income, ethnic background, material status, or uh, uh, marital status, physical or developmental disability. Um, and that's because this proposed navigation center provides the interim ho housing for those that might not have income to pay for it. Um, we are going to be providing those case management services, um, again, to help individuals um, find the resources they need to get back into uh, temporary and permanent housing. Um, the city has identified four modifications uh, as value engineered cost savings that we I uh, think we should be looking at to best spend those grant funds that we have uh, at, uh, attained. And um, as previously mentioned, the city is required to spend 50% of those grant funds by June 30th. From a construction perspective, a construction time framing perspective in particular, um, developing grading plans, 
construction plans, uh, issuing permits, and actually starting the work. That time period, June 30th, effectively was here yesterday. Um, so we're, we're behind the eight ball in terms of trying to move things forward. Um, so to facilitate that timing, um, we wanted to highlight that the resolution includes a very unique condition uh, to implement uh, some recommended modifications that we're gonna go through um, with all of you on the screens here. Uh, the alternative um, to asking the Planning Commission to make some possible modifications in their approval document would be to wait for the applicant team to revise plans and come back at a future date, but that really does start risking some of those dollars that we have associated with the grants. So we very much appreciate uh, your, your willingness to listen to uh, these modifications. So modification number one uh, would realign the drive aisle towards the northern portion of the, of the property. Um, so if you will imagine there's a red dot on the left side of the, the screen here. If you think about a, a kindergarten project where we might have put a thumbtack in, in there and we take the drive aisle and we kind of swing it up to the property line, uh, that's the modification that we're talking about. Clearly parking would need to be uh, re adjusted as we move through that. But the idea of doing that is to uh, create uh, an area that could be developed in the front of the property uh, for this facility, at least something of regular geometry, um, so we could get as many units uh, in that location as possible. Um, and it, what that would allow us uh, in association with possible modification number two is it would draw the facilities nearer to Lawrence Drive. Um, and this modification in particular, after the um, the drive aisle would be pivoted to the north, uh, we would seek to have the uh, check-in facilities brought to the front yard setback. And that's the, the red line that's in the, um, the uh, front of the property. And that aligns with the built development that's on both the north and the so south side of this property. So it fits in with uh, the built environment. Um, but one of the big reasons why we're interested in doing that is we're also able to shift over the buildings that have wet utilities in them. And that is a dramatic and significant cost savings reduction that we could introduce to this project and take some of those dollars from that grant and better spend them uh, more uh, wisely as we're trying to move the project forward. Uh, the third possible modification is uh, to separate some of the structures from each other. Um, as currently designed, we have uh, residential units that have a 10-foot separation from one another um, as you look at front door to front door, and the back of the units uh, about one another. That is something that can be done, but that, that design requires a higher level of uh, fire code um, and building materials um, to design it in that manner. Um, if the units were separated by a minimum of five feet from each other uh, per fire and building code, we actually step down a level of, um, of requirement, if you will. Both are at, both are perfectly uh, safe uh, in terms of a building code and fire code position, uh, perspective, but by separating the units from each other, uh, we again lower the cost to bring this uh, into fruition. So that's something that we're asking the uh, Planning Commission to grant us as we move forward with the project and get confirmed as part of our uh, plan check process. Um, in combination with possible modification one and two, um, we potentially have more developable area to play with. So we still might get significant separations, if you will, from the units. So maybe we still are able to retain those 10 foot separations from front door to front door. Um, that level of detail is not, uh, 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 hasn't been designed as of this point in time, but it's a possibility with the combined um, modifications. And the final possible modification is, as we've worked with the operator team as a whole, we found that there are some redundancies um, in some of the facilities that are being provided, or maybe just duplicative facilities that aren't necessarily needed. For instance, there may be uh, one or two uh, too many offices on site. Uh, the number of laundry facilities, um, there might be a few less than they actually have at other operations, and those other operations are working well. By removing a few laundry facilities, we could actually uh, uh, utilize a smaller modular facility. Um, so some, uh, some modifications are, are being looked at uh, 
uh, to again uh, remove redundancies and result in lower project costs so we're able to actually attain this project. Uh, we did look at the project in terms of consistency with zoning and the simple answer is there aren't any waivers that are requested. This is a project that is 100% consistent with the M1 zoning uh, regulations as well as our emergency shelter regulations. Um, our traffic team uh, analyzed this project as well and uh, emergency shelter is not a, uh, uh, a use which is in the ITE manuals. Um, so we used the next best fit, uh, and that was an assisted living facility uh, was the next best closest fit. And utilizing that, we found that there'd be uh, 11 p.m. peak hour trips based on the, uh, the comparable definitions and metrics. Um, 11 peak, uh, peak hour trips is below the city's 100 p.m. peak hour trip threshold. And because of that, we didn't go through uh, the traffic study or the VMT analysis, finding out the project uh, is exempt from those processes. And finally, uh, the project uh, fits into two different categories in regards to CEQA. Uh, first and foremost, um, for, for the regular categories, uh, we find that it's consistent with our class 32 exemption, the infill exemption, and that the project is within the city limits. It's uh, on a project site. Uh, the actual developable area is less than five acres in size. This one is just uh, over one acre in size. Uh, the site is substantially surrounded by urban development. The site has no value uh, as habitat for endangered species um, uh, or rare or threatened species. And uh, the project would not have any significant effects related to traffic, noise, air quality or water quality. Um, and in that light, the project is in an area serviced uh, with all available utilities that can service this project. Uh, we also looked at the exceptions to the exemptions based in CEQA and none of those exceptions uh, were triggered as part of this project. So uh, the categorical exemption for um, infill development is absolutely appropriate uh, for this development. In addition to that, uh, because this project is a low barrier navigation center, that is a use which is allowed by right, and uses which are allowed by right are statutorily exempt from CEQA as well. In terms of public correspondence and outreach, uh, we uh, went through and posted our a notice of application on the site and mailed out our notices on August 31st of this year. And we also uh, published our uh, notice of hearing. We mailed our notice of hearing and um, posted it on site on October 9th of this year. Uh, through that engagement, there's been some contact that we've had from members of the public asking about uh, the project. Um, I'll summarize that in a little bit, but I wanna take a step back actually and talk about some outreach that we as a city have collectively done. Uh, since September 2022, um, staff has participated in various community, community engagement activities um, to help uh, engage as well as educate the community about the proposed navigation center. Um, and to highlight some of those, uh, it included uh, recording a podcast um, to address homelessness with the ACORN newspapers. Uh, city staff attended the Rancho Caneo Homeowners Association meeting and answered questions directly from residents. Uh, the city hosted a community webinar uh, addressing the needs of the unhoused in Thousand Oaks uh, with a panel of industry experts. Uh, the city staff has presented the Council on Aging as well as the Youth Commission. And then uh, through social media, we've engaged with Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram just to get the message out there and to explain what this is and where it was being proposed. Um, and uh, city staff has also met with various brokers representing several of the property owners um, and business owners uh, within the Rancho Caneo industrial area. Through all of those efforts and leading up to here, uh, staff has received and responded to several phone calls uh, requesting details about the project. Um, and generally the questions that we heard had to do with um, you know, what are the unintended consequences that we may be dealing with here? It was probably the number one question that we received. Um, in addition, uh, there were uh, general questions and concerns about security and questions about 
um, what happens with non-compliant patrons, and um, is it an issue that this navigation center is only a parcel removed from the cannabis dispensary in town? Um, to address those concerns, uh, we uh, engage in those conversations, but more importantly, from a pragmatic, procedural, operational manner, we engaged um, uh, with the developer to develop conditions of approval as part of this project. Um, and the city continues to engage with the operators and the county um, in that uh, draft uh, operations plan that I spoke about, which will help control and, and alleviate those concerns. Uh, of note, for the Planning Commission, we really wanted to highlight the good neighbor policy that's been implemented as part of this project. Um, and that's intended to require neighborhood patrols of uh, the project vicinity or throughout the project vicinity uh, by navigation center staff. The intent is for the staff to really proactively engage with neighboring properties uh, to build that dialogue, to build uh, 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 stakeholders, if you will, um, and really engage with a direct dialogue. If there is an issue, let the navigation center uh, hear it first to really try to um, address issues as they may arise if they do arise. Uh, the staff report includes um, that condition. And since the publication of the staff report, the city hasn't received any uh, written comments about this project, nor have I received any phone calls about this project since we sent out the notice of hearing uh, for you tonight. So um, in conclusion, we find that this project is consistent with the general plan, um, as well as our city requirements in regards to uh, zoning controls, in regards to emergency shelter operation standards. Uh, we find that the project is consistent with our architectural and our landscaping design guidelines. Um, and ultimately this project provides a financially prudent, dignified and flexible approach to providing emergency shelters in town. Uh, based on the analysis and the findings contained in the uh, approval documents that are before you tonight, um, we recommend that the uh, Planning Commission approve, the, for, well, first, uh, exempt the project, or first, find the project is categorically, categorically exempt from CEQA and statutorily exempt under the government code, as well as approve the special use permit as presented to you tonight. And with that, staff, uh, myself, and a whole team that's out here, uh, we're available for any questions that you may have. So thank you. Okay, who has questions? Commissioner Link? Thank you. A uh, couple of questions regarding, uh, I guess, could you provide me a definition with what an emergency shelter is in this context? I think the majority of us would probably think of as emergency as a result of a natural disaster, but this is a completely different context in this situation. Yeah, in this context, the emergency shelter really is about homeless services. Um, so individuals who um, find themselves for whatever reason out of uh, housing and they're trying to uh, land on their feet, this would be a place to put a, a roof over their head and uh, some food for them as they're trying to move forward. A navigation center takes it another step, which is providing those services uh, to really help navigate someone back to homelessness opposed to, sorry, to home, uh, not homelessness, but to being housed. Um, and um, I'll stop there. Uh, playing on the, I guess, the word uh, navigation. So how is transportation handled for uh, those that do not own automobiles or, or don't have the ability to, say, come from one end of Thousand Oaks to Newberry Park? Yeah, uh, so the draft operations plan as currently written requires the operator to provide transportation. The exact mechanism of what that would look like may evolve over time. And when the operators uh, do give their presentation, I'm going to defer their initial approach. Um, uh, you to their, uh, I'll defer your question to them in particular to talk about how that actually they anticipate that to happen um, at the outset of the project. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, participants who have active felony, felony warrants are not allowed to be uh, housed at this location. How is that ascertained prior to, or is that conducted at the time of, of intake, I suppose? So as a referral project, um, the, uh, the participants of this facility get entered into the county's uh, 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 continuum of care uh, system. 
And as part of that, as I understand it, and again, the operators are here and they can speak about that a little bit more, um, there is that check at that point in time getting um, as one gets placed into that system. And then one last question, I think this might actually be for the operator as well, but uh, as far as the uh, neighborhood patrol, the good neighbor policy, uh, did the city and the operator consult with Ventura County Sheriff as far as drafting that plan? Uh, the sheriff has been an active part of the uh, overall team, if you will, so it's a uh, multiple approach. Um, we'll also point out that the city of Oxnard um, has similar uh, policy and conditions for their navigation center that um, was approved a few years back as well. So there, there's some um, precedence for that type of condition. Um, and ultimately, when it really comes down to it, it's a good neighbor policy that we would expect of any property owner um, throughout the entire city, regardless of what use uh, are on adjacent properties. Thank you. Commissioner Lanza. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Colwitz, for your report. It was actually uh, great listening to the report now and at the conference that we were at last week. Uh, I did have just a few questions, and they, they may come back to the applicant. But um, just as an overview, I know we're partnering, but just to get specific, this is a lease of the one-acre property? That is correct. And the terms of that lease haven't been done yet, correct? That is correct. That is a city council action, um, a separate matter altogether from the Planning Commission's review of the special use permit. Because I noticed that we have the usual defense and indemnity as part of it, but it's only as to the construction. I'm assuming as operations would be part of the lease that would be entered into later, I'm assuming. Yes, that would be correct. We have at least two agreements. One's going to be the operations agreement. One's going to be the development agreement um, as far as developing the property with one of the applicants. And then the third, of course, is the lease that goes with the management of the property. Okay. And what about the remaining five acres? Is that not subject to anything as part of this? Uh, approximately 0.2 are currently occupied by the uh, battery facility and that's going to remain as is and there aren't any other plans uh, for development on the other portions. Our public works team has been utilizing the site so it's anticipated that uh, we would continue using it as such uh, into the future uh, as kind of a status quo if you will. And the battery facility is above ground, I'm assuming? It, it is. Uh, they're in Connex boxes, and it's uh, gated as well in the back of the facility. And the, uh, the property immediately to the north has an electric uh, grid set up. I'm assuming that's not in any way affected by the use of this project? Uh, that is correct. Um, so the, the, there was a question actually asked at the conference that I, I wanted to re restate just to kind of get a better answer. The, the actual structures themselves are modular, correct? That is correct. What is the useful life of those those structures? That's a question that I'm also going to defer to the applicant team. Basically being at the end of the day, how long do these last in terms of overall what the lease term is and, and stuff like that, so we can, we can get into that. Um, and this, since we have the sheriffs here, I thought I'd make sure that they didn't come for nothing. Um, <laughs> I, I'm a lawyer by, by day, so one of the things I know is years ago there was a law or a court decision that found that we cannot enforce various laws without a, a uh, homeless shelter. Does this complex satisfy that court decision for purposes of enforcing those laws? I'm getting a nod, but. So uh, let me jump in too just because um, there's a number of cases that, and we can get into it as much detail as you want to, but I think basically you're talking about the Boise case. and. And there was previously a 2006 case from out of LA that kind of started this theme. And, and what would happen with uh, some of those cases in Los Angeles is that um, the judge was, was basically stating that there was a revolving door where p people were getting arrested for sleeping in, on the sidewalk. They were going to jail. They were serving their one or two days in jail and then they were being released and the judge was getting frustrated because it was like a revolving door. He didn't think that the the jail system was appropriate and the court system was the appropriate mechanism to deal with that issue. And so in the past you had what we call the, uh, the defense of necessity and that is you could use that in a criminal case, you can say I had to take this action based upon necessity of these circumstances, right? And so one of the defenses of necessity was that, oh, I had nowhere else to go. And so the court turned that argument, instead of making it a defense of necessity, it became, oh, we're gonna make that the affirmative. And so that was really the start of this change that the Boise case, uh, Ninth District jumped on and said, um, 
if you don't have places for them to sleep, then you are basically, in a sense, violating their rights because they they um, have no place to go to, and so you are, in a sense, I mean, it, it, there's arguments both ways, right? But it, you are you are um, basically uh, um, affecting their rights um, for not a, providing them a place to sleep, and since they don't have a place to sleep, it's it's a violation of their rights. And that's evolved. There's been a couple of more cases that have, have kind of taken that theme and, and evolved it. It's uh, frankly, it might be going in front of the Supreme Court maybe uh, the next year or so. Um, but nevertheless, that's kind of the, the germane behind it. The goal for this navigation center is to, and you heard a little bit from Mr. Colwitz, is to have an ability to have locations open or, or beds open for this very specific reason. So they do not have that, they have an ability to go someplace and we say we have an open place for you. You cannot be here, you cannot be doing what you are doing because we have met that obligation. That one critical part is there's a place for you to go to. Um, there's a lot of other factors and you can ask the Sheriff's Department of course about those, but you know a lot of it is their, their desire to do that, right? Versus, you know, I don't wanna do that. Okay, well now you're, in, you're violating these various codes, whether it's penal code or whether it's the city Thousand Oaks code, you're violating these codes and your option was to go to this location and if you're refusing that now, you no longer have that ability to say, I, I'm, you know, I, I have to uh, do this because I don't have any place to go which is kind of the underlying theme, right? And that's what I was asking in terms of if that's... Yeah, lies. so you, you heard, I think, the plan is that we're gonna reserve it for the sheriffs to have at least a number of units available for them for that specific purpose. And is that aligned with your view and your yeah, understanding? Yeah, I'll, I'll give like the non-lawyer answer. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, bas basically, you know, there's a whole bunch of case law going out. I can't guarantee the case law will stay the same. But as of right now, we really don't have the ability to enforce uh, a lot of like sleeping in public spaces. So this will give us give us that ability um, at this point. It's going to be an important part of the overall tools of addressing homelessness. It's uh, it's not like it's a you know final nail in the coffin that's going to help us end all homelessness or ever to be doing it. But it is going to be a very important tool for us to address homelessness in the city. And your understanding is there's a process set up whereby if you're your sheriffs are out doing patrol and have a situation, they have a, a way to contact the facility, to kind of set yeah, that process so, up. Yeah, so I could, I could go on hours for this, you guys don't want that, but I'll tell you, basically right now, I have two deputies sitting here behind me that are specially trained and have all the contact info and know every homeless person in town and know all the service providers. We've expanded that recently to I have a deputy that's working on every shift, so that's all they do full time. I have a deputy on every shift that's cross-trained uh, also to be able to do that. So we have 24 hours a day, seven day a week coverage. So that what we foresee happening when this resource is available to us is any time of the day or night, I'll have a deputy that's able to make these contacts and uh, process somebody through the system to get them uh, into the shelter. And, and just for clarity, what do you do now without the ability to have this facility? Uh, so true. people, if they're on private property, we can remove people, but right. if they're sleeping on public spaces, they're allowed to sleep there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, there's things we can address. We can address drug dealing. We can address, you know, trash accumulation and things like that. Um, but as far as sleeping, they're allowed to. Uh, I'm assuming that this is, this is somewhat, I hate to, hate to say this phrase drop in the bucket, but I'm assuming this is not going to be sufficient for all the people that we have that might be in need of a home. You know, that's a good question um, because what we've already seen is we have been clean, doing a lot of cleaning up around the city, I'm sure you're aware, over the last couple of years. Um, you know, it's one of these things, it's uncomfortable for people to be, uh, to change. And sometimes when, you know, that becomes uh, the option of going back home and changing your ways becomes more comfortable than trying to again move and find another place. So some of these people have made their way back home. Um, some of them have actually sought treatment and made it to it, and our, our guys are very patient with people in that way of continuing to ask and provide um, services, and sometimes it takes a long time before people do. But again, this is another tool that will help us to move people, uh, hopefully, into housing, into some of them, like I said, will return home. So that, that's a hard answer to, to, to give, because I, you know, we're not, we obviously aren't gonna have a bed for every single person that's homeless. Um, but in all reality, we, we don't necessarily need one for every person that's homeless. Does that make sense? 
And again, just back to Mr. Colwitz, so there's an application process to make sure that we're looking hopefully at members of Thousand Oaks. Um, that, that, that's a process that the, the operator goes through, right? Well, that is accurate. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. Any questions? Any further questions for Mr. Kettlehawk? You've done yeoman service tonight, Scott. It's very, very impressive. Um, another lawyer question. Who's insuring the site? That'll be done through the lease agreement. And so just to, again, be clear, we are still negotiating the, the various agreements for this project, and it's a separate issue, um, not for tonight, of course, but so that is part of that analysis. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, I just want to make clear that when you noticed this project, you noticed a nearby um, owners, but also the, the occupants of the nearby properties? Yes. Okay. My next question is, you showed us one of the first slides was um, the modification number one, where you would like to possibly move the drive north. There were some parking spaces that will be in the way. Where will they go? Ultimately, we're, that'll be a detail um, as we go through the construction documents, but some will be retained in the front of the property where the check-in facilities would be and to provide for some of the service providers that will be um, coming to the site, whether that's police, food services, medical services, but then others might be on the back side of the property as well as we're moving things around uh, east to west, if you will. But we won't lose any of them. We won't lose any. We have to provide a minimum of 14 on site. Um, the site plan that I was actually submitted to you only had 12, so we had to actually pick up a few from the one that had been distributed to you. But the project had been conditioned to provide a minimum of 14, and that'll be the case moving forward. Okay, and okay, this is kind of a weird question, but um, as you develop the first phase, um, and now you have residents there, now you're gonna develop behind it. So I'm curious about noise and dust and machinery moving past these houses where people are living. Have you thought about doing something in the reverse or is it not, is it not as bad as I'm anticipating? So uh, yes, we have thought about that. Um, ultimately what's happening is we're putting all the backbone infrastructure in the first phase. So that's all the heavy grading, the infrastructure that happens underground. And we're basically prepping the site uh, for the future units. Uh, as modular units, the actual installation of these would be, not to put it lightly, but basically pulling up with the truck, putting it, taking off the truck and putting it on the foundation and driving away. So the ultimate impact to residents and operators um, will be very minimal for the second phase of the project. All the heavy lifting is in the front uh, first phase. Thank you. My last question is on page 21, um, you have listed all the different um, uh, organizations that will be referring to Hope the Mission, the, the possible residents. And I'm wondering who ultimately decides and will one agency have more weight on these decisions of, for the res residents? Give us one second as we figure out the best person to answer that for you. Thank you. We're, we're segueing into the applicant's presentation. Okay. But <laughs> do, you want me, do you want me to wait? But, uh, you can go ahead and answer okay. this question. I don't see why not. Yeah, okay. I, I'll quickly answer. My name is Rick Schrader. I'm president of Many Mansions. The, the, the um, referrals will come through the coordinated entry system as part of the Ventura County um, Continuum of Care. So these various agencies are referring and putting people into the system, into the coordinated entry system, but ultimately they will be coming from the county. They'll be county referrals. So. Okay, thank you. Hi, if I may, Chair, just add one additional comment. So you did ask the question, does an organization have more weight? No organization does 
does not carry more weight than the others. The only beds that will be set aside for one specific organization are those beds that are dedicated for law enforcement. Okay, thank you. That, that makes a lot more sense to me now. Um, Chair, I just had one more quick question. Commissioner here. Link. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Colwitz, just a quick question. With regard to the four possible modifications to the project, so tonight we're in essence approving the project description. The number of units doesn't change. We're just looking at design options. No, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, and now Mr. Schrader, you can come up officially and uh, you have 15 minutes. Thank you, Chair McMahon, uh, members of the Planning Commission, uh, members of city staff. My name is Rick Schrader. I'm president of Many Mansions. And I do want to thank Mr. Kolwitz for presenting and describing this proposed project. Uh, our team, Many Mansions, Dignity Moves, Hope of the Mission, uh, stands ready to answer all of your questions and address any of your concerns. But first, we'd like to take some time just to tell you a little bit more about who we are, who we are as a nonprofit organization, what is our mission, what are some of our successes, and what do we hope to achieve by developing and, and operating this proposed navigation center? I think as most of you know, Many Mansions is a nonprofit affordable housing and service provider. We were founded in 1979 right here in the city of Thousand Oaks. And one thing that unites all three of our organizations is that our mission is to provide, um, to assist those in the community most in need, especially those who are suffering from homelessness. And indeed, our homeless population has been increasing over the years in Ventura County. This year's homeless count was 2,238, the highest since 2007. And that number has increased every year since 2017. And more importantly, the number of unsheltered homeless persons, those living in the streets, in encampments, in their cars, have increased increased by 20% this past year. And I think the Sheriff's Department uh, would agree. Um, Many Mansions is in fact the leading provider of permanent supportive housing in Ventura County. That permanent supportive housing is affordable housing for those experiencing homelessness. We have developed uh, over 21 affordable housing communities in Los Angeles and Ventura counties, nine here in the city of Thousand Oaks, of over 407, or of 740 restricted affordable units. We provide on-site life enriching services for our residents. And we have a number of properties, a number of projects currently in construction, including, including two permanent supportive housing uh, projects in the county of Ventura. And indeed, we have been pushing for this interim housing for the past 30 years because we see it as a necessary link to take people off the streets, off the encampments, and quickly move them into that permanent housing. And that's why we're involved in this project. Now, you know quite a bit about many mansions, uh, so, but you don't know as much perhaps about uh, Dignity Moves and Hope of the Mission. And we are thrilled that both Dignity Moves and Hope of the Mission are part of this team. And we have Marge Caffarelli, the Chief Real Estate Officer of Dignity Moves, to talk about Dignity Moves, who is our lead, who is our lead developer, and Hope of the Mission, a Ken Kraft, its CEO, CEO, who will be the lead service provider. So I'll turn it over uh, to Dignity Moves. Thank you so much, uh, Chair McMahon, commissioners, city staff. Uh, I too am impressed by Scott tonight. He's been really pretty impressive in his presentations. Um, I am the Chief Real Estate Officer of Dignity Moves. And just to give you a little background, I know that in the staff report, in the footnotes, it gives a little blurb about each of the 501c3s here this evening. 
and Dignity Moves has 150 years of combined experience. Well, I can qualify for 40 of those years. Uh, in my past life, I was a commercial real estate developer for 40 years, retired, and came back to work with Dignity Moves to help them scale. And what we do uh, at Dignity Moves is we build interim supportive housing. So none of our uh, residents pay rent. Our projects are all financed either through philanthropy, uh, encampment resolution fund grants, home key grants, BHBH grants, which are behavioral health. We partner with cities and counties and service providers to build these projects. You, you see uh, on the screen now, uh, this is the Santa Barbara project. We have a, a, a project wide in Santa, uh, in Santa Barbara, countywide project in Santa Barbara County called Dignity Now, where we have raised $11 million to build uh, these two projects. One is Hope Village, 94 units, and the other is La Posada, uh, 80 units. The project that you see on the screen right now is uh, 34 units that was opened in August of 2022. And since August of 2022, 60 people have come through that project and have gone into either permanent supportive housing, permanent housing, or assisted living. You can go to the next slide. And this is what uh, a unit would look like, approximately 70 square feet with a door that has a lock on it, a bed, uh, a desk, a chair where they can come and get their lives back together with service providers' help, case management, intensive case management, 24-hour security, uh, and you know the the safety, if you will, of being uh, in a in a residence or not a residence, but in a space like this. Uh, next slide talks about the the projects. Uh, that we currently have, and just you know, to give you a little uh, a little bit of uh, background, we currently have over a dozen projects either uh, under construction or in planning. And again, Santa Maria, we have 94 units. La Posada, 80. Those are both in Santa Barbara County. Thousand Oaks, I put it in as 50 because eventually it will be, you know, hopefully 50 units. In Los Angeles, we're working uh, on four sites currently that would uh, total 200 units. Oakland, that's a home key project for homeless seniors, 40 units. San Bernardino with Lutheran Social Services in the city of San Bernardino, 144 permanent interim units, and that's also a home key project. Watsonville with the county of Monterey and the county of Santa Cruz, 30 units. Atlanta, I know that seems strange, but we're consulting with the, the city of Atlanta and a couple of nonprofits on their first 100 units. Uh, Morro Bay with the county of San Luis Obispo, 20. San Luis Obispo County, 80 units. Uh, and those 80 units are uh, 46 permanent supportive housing units and 34 interim units. Grover Beach, 30 that will open in December. San Jose, we just got approved 150 units. Sacramento, 50. And Modesto with uh, Stanislaus, Stanislaus County, uh, 45 units. So our first project was 33 Goff in downtown San Francisco, 70 units. Second project was uh, downtown Santa Barbara, literally in the heart of downtown Santa Barbara. Uh, our third project was Labeth Landing in Sonoma County, uh, and that was a home key project, 60 units. And our fourth project was Dignity Village in the city of Alameda, and that was also 47 units, and that was a home key project. We are delighted to have been selected with this amazing team and to be able to work with 
your really amazing staff on this project. We think it'll be a great, uh, you know, really a great opportunity for those that are experiencing homelessness in the city of Thousand Oaks. Uh, and if, if we have one last slide that I just I was gonna have uh, Scott pull up, and this is just a sort of an axonometric view of our Hope Village project in Santa Maria, just to give you kind of an idea what 94 units looks like. And you can just kind of go through that. Uh, we have just a couple more slides of that. Um, I have with us uh, tonight via Zoom, uh, Drew Armetta, who is one of, he's our lead architect with Ginsler. Uh, Ginsler, uh, the, the firm Ginsler Architects, they, um, they're the largest architectural firm in the world. And we have a master agreement with them. They work with us uh, with low bono rates to do this work all up and down uh, the coast of California. So Drew is here also to answer any questions that you might have. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ken Kraft. Well, commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to share for a moment. Uh, my name is Ken Kraft. I'm the founder and CEO at Hope the Mission, formerly Hope of the Valley Rescue Mission. We did change our name a year ago. Uh, because we started very humbly in the San Fernando Valley 14 years ago by serving hot meals to the people that were homeless, and we've continued to grow and to expand. We are now the largest rescue mission in the country, uh, actually twice as large as any other rescue mission, and that's all happened in 14 years. Why? Because we've taken a very aggressive uh, approach to dealing with what I believe is a humanitarian crisis with the numbers of people that are languishing and suffering on our streets, and so... Um, we had the privilege of working with the city of Los Angeles to open the very first tiny home community. It was on Chandler Boulevard in North Hollywood. A couple months later, opened the second one, which then was the largest tiny home community in the country uh, at Alexandria Park. And then we opened the third one that was in a parking lot in Reseda, then a fourth one that was in a metro parking lot, then the fifth one that was in Caltrans land, sixth one that was in another parking lot um, between downtown LA and Pasadena, and then the um, the Veterans Administration asked if we take over the VA on the west side, and we said yes. And uh, so we currently have 22 shelter locations with 2,400 beds. And I will say that we are at near capacity every night. And one of the things that I believe that has really contributed to our success is our staff. Uh, we have put a lot of energy and effort into recruiting and training um, staff members to be effective at helping people change their lives. Nobody comes to the rescue mission or nobody comes to our facilities on a good day, okay, unless you're volunteering. But when you do come, usually the wheels have fallen off. You've uh, had some kind of setback in your life. And so we are committed to helping people get back their lives. And so our, you know, we currently uh, do have 630 employees. They don't all work at the shelters. We do have five thrift stores and we have access centers and we have navigation centers, which are drop-in centers where we help people uh, with job training, job placement. We did launch our own mental health department uh, a year ago uh, with the anticipation and the goal of having mental health professionals inside each of our shelters because we recognize how severe that problem is and we don't want to just deal with the fruit we want to deal with the root and oftentimes the root has to do with these underlying issues that led somebody into homelessness or those underlying issues that are preventing them from ultimately being housed and so whereas we do not currently have homeless service operations in Ventura County I was born in Ventura I was raised in Ventura went to Buena High School all three of my kids went to Thousand Oaks High School. Uh, so this is my, my roots, my stomping grounds, and, and I was just waiting for that right opportunity to be able to provide services uh, here in, uh, in Ventura County, but specifically Thousand Oaks. This is like a dream come true. Um, 
So we, I believe as an agency, we do have the organizational capacity, we have the experience. Uh, also, we are very proactive in working with the community because in the absence of information, people create their own narratives. And oftentimes people become fearful, they hear about, well, what are you doing, you're gonna be attracting this or that. And so we meet with the community, we address the questions, and also we make ourselves very available. Uh, I tell the local community, you're our eyes and ears. We can't see everything, so if you see see something, let us know. I, I give out my own cell phone uh, because I want, I want to make sure that we are addressing everything and every issue. And as we do, we are proactive and I look forward to working with law enforcement. I love the relationship that law enforcement has with the city of, of, uh, of Thousand Oaks. We don't necessarily have that to that degree in Los Angeles, so this is really a bonus to be able to work so closely with law enforcement. And I will say this, we work for you. And so we work with the local community um, we are used to working with what's called a scope of required services where the city says this is the way we want it operated and we conform to that. And so we, we look forward to working with city staff as we give, um, fully design and uh, you know, complete that, what that scope's gonna be and so that we can fulfill that. Um, I think my, I'm out of time. But, uh, you know, so, but we're, we're here to answer questions and to make sure that uh, you know that you are, if, if this goes through, that we're gonna operate uh, an incredible facility on the highest standards uh, here in Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, probably you should not leave. <laughs> uh, questions? Someone? Anybody? No questions? Commissioner Lanson? Uh, you, you probably heard before I asked, uh, up. Good evening, by the way. Thank you for being here and doing this project. Um, the, the, the lifespan of the modular units uh, in terms of what the ultimate design is. So the units, we work with multiple modular manufacturers, but the units that we're proposing for this site would have a 30, 40 year lifespan. They are incredibly well built. They're built in uh, Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, this is a, a longer term lease and they will, they're reusable. They can be picked up with a, for, with a forklift and, and moved to another location if, if that is the case. But they will, they will last a very long time. And my understanding is the foundation's done and then it just basically goes on that foundation and it can be replaced as you're saying, right? Yeah, th so these particular units have a self-leveling uh, piece to them. Uh, and they will be anchored into the ground on a foundation, yes. Okay. Uh, and just, again, any one of you can answer this question, but I just kind of want to make sure I understand. I know there's certain units that are, are reserved, so to speak, uh, in terms of what law enforcement may, may need. Um, in terms of when people come through, is this for anybody in the county, or is this people for Thousand Oaks, or is there some demographic in terms of exactly what kind of people you're looking to have as part of this facility? The, it, it, it's, the priority is for people that are homeless in Thousand Oaks. Okay, that's, that, that, I thought so, but again, it, it sounded like you were. And, and to be clear, it's also, there's no children as well. So okay. We're talking single couples, adults, we're not talking about. I'll ask children. the obvious question then, what about pets? Yeah, I was, yes, we have, uh, we have pets, lots of pets, lots okay. of uh, service animals. And also, like, I will just say, so typically what happens is you have an agency or an outreach team or law enforcement that would call the continuum of care. And that, you know, within the county, they would be the ones that ultimately make that decision, knowing what the prioritization is for the particular site. And so knowing that it's in Thousand Oaks, going to prioritize those in Thousand Oaks, and working with law enforcement to make sure that the right people are getting in those beds. Okay. All right. Thank you. I have nothing further. Any other questions? Commissioner Ferris? Uh, I'm going to step in if Commissioner Lanson hasn't already asked his question. Are you fine with all of the conditions as they're stated? Especially <laughs> given that we're being asked to uh, approve some things before they're actually uh, in the design plan so that we can accelerate the process. And... Uh, yes, we are. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a, a one question and a couple of comments. The first question is, uh, 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 the object is to move these residents to more permanent stable housing. Once they are out and into the more stable housing, is there someone who follows up with them and keeps up with them and makes sure they're doing okay? Well, yeah, well, 
yeah, we all have experience in that. In permanent supportive housing, what makes it supportive housing is that there are on-site case managers at that permanent housing. So the case managers would receive the referral from the Navigation Center, would talk with the case manager there, would have the person transfer, move into the permanent supportive housing, and they would have a, a dialogue. Okay. And then there would be on-site support for that person. Okay, and so my next two comments, the first one is about the dog run and the dog, what do you call it, elimination area. Um, I love the idea that people can bring their dogs. You know, they're very important. And I was thinking of someone who was living there, and I thought of some amenity that might be inexpensive but would be really useful, and that would be a stationary table and a hose so they could wash their dogs. Uh, I would love it if you would consider putting that in. And if I may, yeah, we, one of the things, I find people are actually more generous giving to pets than people sometimes. Uh, people get really excited about other pets, and we have foundations that have, are willing to give money. We have dog food, we have kennels, we have collars, we have leashes, and anything that we present like that, they're excited to help make that happen. Okay, and secondly, um, there are a couple of areas in the city where um, the city has provided these, uh, what do you call it, uh, bike fix stations. They're very inexpensive. They're like a post where you can put your bike on it and then change a tire, check your brakes, that kind of thing. I would think that since you are um, including bike racks and encouraging bike riding, um, one or two of those would be an, an inexpensive amenity. That's a great idea, and also I will say that you know the transportation component, we will be making sure that people get from the site down to where public transportation is taking place so that people aren't just walking you know, through the industrial complexes. We wanna make sure that uh, we have that good neighbor policy in place, that we have little to no impact uh, upon the, uh, the, the surrounding community. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? All right. Um, I just wanted to answer uh, Commissioner Kettlehut's question about insurance. Dignity Moves will carry general liability and either we will carry builder's risk or the general contractor will carry builder's risk, whoever gets the best uh, quote, and um, the general contractor will carry all of the general liability and then the insurance beyond that will be part of the lease and, and ongoing. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, uh, we have one public speaker card, uh, someone in, in on site, and then we have two on Zoom. So will Mark Leaf please come? State your name and city of residence. Good long evening. Um, my name is Mark Leaf. Um, my wife and I um, own a, a manufacturing business on Lavery Court, uh, which is essentially within a block of the property. Um, we also live in Rancho Caneo Village, which is essentially within a mile of the property. And I'd like to st uh, start off by saying that we do support this project. And I'm just here to um, essentially make a few suggestions slash questions um, with regard to the project. Um, first off, I understand that the primary residents of the project will be homeless individuals, but I'd like to better understand to what extent, if any, that our neighbors who are living in RVs will have the opportunity to transition to the navigation center. There are easily a dozen or more inhabited uh, permanent RVs, um, and if, uh, if you frequent Newberry Park, it's very clear and in the front and the back of uh, Target, uh, Home Depot, Hillcrest Drive, there's many, many people who are living that way. I understand that there are complications for people who live in RVs and many of them may like that, but I would have a question as to whether we can address some of that um, uh, uh, unhoused population with the navigation center. Um, with regard, and, but with regard to the, uh, the way the site is laid out, I did not see any real opportunity for RV, RV parking, so I would assume that if somebody were to transition to the NAV Center, 
they would have to abandon their RV. So I understand the complication of that. Um, one of the things that I did note, um, and this is more of an infrastructure um, suggestion, and I don't, I don't know if we can look at the site, the overall site, kind of broadly as it relates to sidewalks. Um, Newberry Park is kind of a scattergun, uh, particularly on Lawrence Drive with regard to sidewalks. There's been a lot of development in the northern end of biotech, um, pharma, um, and a lot of warehouse properties. Um, in the last five years, it's really exploded. The sidewalk has not really been provided between uh, most of the way between um, uh, Rancho Caneo and Teller. And so for this property, um, I would encourage the city to consider, and again, I don't know that this is the right forum, but when you consider that the people who are going to be using the, the uh, mitigation center, the navigation center, excuse me, um, hopefully will find employment opportunities in that main corridor where we have Target, Home Depot, many restaurants, Wendy's on the other side. The street there is very unsafe for pedestrians. It has a high rise as it goes to the north, which makes um, it difficult to see people when you're coming the opposite direction. And there is no pedestrian um, thoroughfare. So people typically walk on private property to make sure they're not in the, um, the, uh, the right of way. Um, and also um, there's competition with bicyclists because it is a fairly uh, popular uh, bike area. So I do think that if the city has a plan or could consider a plan to actually complete the sidewalk um, between um, Rancho Caneo and Teller on the same side of the street, I think it would be very beneficial to the residents. Um, the last thing that I, I would like to um, suggest is that I know that there's going to be some fits and starts as it relates to getting the project off the ground, getting people in there. Um, I would like to um, appeal to the, um, the organizers and the, uh, the folks who are running this project to create some type of a web portal or another way that people from the community, such as myself, when we see things that we have questions or concerns about, we can report it directly. Um, presumably and hopefully there would be somebody from the city who would also have access to monitor that as well. So you don't just start getting random calls about complaints or concerns about this, that, and the other thing. That would, I think, be really a good part of a good neighbor policy to provide that access. And then you can essentially address those uh, community concerns right there and then. And I believe, oh, last thing I would say is I just wanted to reiterate um, that I do support the project. I think it's well-intentioned and well thought out, and I welcome it to the community. Thank you. Um, we have uh, two uh, speakers on Zoom, so I'll call Jackson Piper first. Hello, Planning Commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you, Planning Commissioners. My name is Jackson Piper from Newbury Park. Um, I'm calling in to support this project and to state that um, I think it's a very thoughtfully designed, uh, well create, well conceived project. Um, I should mention I'm uh, with Ventura County EMB, which is a um, housing activist group in Ventura County. I'm also part of the Thousand Oaks Livability Action Network and the Conejo Housing Coalition, um, all of which is to push for uh, more housing and better housing that's affordable for people in the Conejo Valley and throughout Ventura County. And um, I think, uh, I don't wanna be too long-winded here, but I just wanna say, this doesn't in and of itself solve homelessness, but without projects like this, uh, we're never as a community or as a society going to be able to solve um, the issues of homelessness that have been really growing and becoming more visible over the last, uh, especially the last decade. Um, as a housing activist, I can tell you that California has not built enough housing to meet the demand since I believe the year 1980, which means that there's been more and more and more pressure on the existing housing stock uh, to provide the space needed for people to live. And that's driven up prices 
and other factors have affected the cost of living. And so what we've seen is that the cost of living has just skyrocketed compared to uh, the rise in, in wages, which has been fairly um, you know, small uh, comparatively. Um, and this has had several effects, one of which is pushing people out of the state who no longer feel they can afford to live here. And uh, the other of which is pushing people onto the streets that still want to try to live in the communities that they grew up in or nearby where they can, but uh, realistically just can't access the housing because they don't have the financial resources to do so anymore. Um, and we've seen this kind of steadily increase since around that 1980 point, but really it, it took off um, at about the point of the 2008 recession and uh, the, the financial shock that a lot of people experienced then. Um, you know, we've talked about the economy recovering since then and all that, and then we've had COVID and all the economic effects of that. The reality is that for a lot of people, there was no recovery from 2008 and there, there was no recovery really from uh, future or the later economic impacts um, that they've had to endure. Uh, the, the economies recovered on the national level and um, for some people on a, a more local level, but a lot of people have spent the last uh, decade and a half struggling to survive. And so that's where we see, uh, I think a lot of the increase in homelessness coming from. So you have a project like this, which provides, um, you know, several dozen, uh, new roofs over the heads of people that were formerly living on the street. Um, and that doesn't entirely solve homelessness in Thousand Oaks, but it also is a big step towards uh, meeting that goal. And hopefully it will inspire other communities in this county to do the same and start building up our infrastructure to actually meet the need of our homeless population. And then this step leads to the next step, which is um, connecting the people in interim housing with more permanent housing uh, and with the jobs and with the services they need in terms of uh, mental health um, services and for some addiction services and other services they need to get their lives um, back on track and no longer be in need of um, the community to support them. So please uh, approve this, um, recommend approving this to the city council and keep setting an example, um, showing that this community cares about its homeless and cares about solving this problem. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Jonathan Duran. Please state your name and city of residence. Jonathan, Mr. Duran, please unmute. Mr. Duran is not unmuting himself. Okay, should we move on then? Okay, um, let's see, we now go back to staff for follow-up comments. Chair McMahon, uh, thank you. Um, so a couple of, uh, one comment for me and then we're gonna look at some colleagues to help out here. Uh, we just wanted to remind the planning commissioner, clarify that the approval authority for this special use permit is in your hands tonight. So this, uh, this item is not headed to the city council for the special use permit. Um, um, and then there were some comments that were made regarding um, those that live in RVs and maybe transitioning into a facility like that. Uh, we're gonna look uh, to our colleagues in the, in the police department here uh, to make uh, some comments about that. And then uh, our colleagues up in the public works team uh, will lead uh, the conversation regarding infrastructure and sidewalks in and around the neighborhood. And with that, that'll conclude, I think, staff's comments. Thank you. Um, so, did, okay, so here we go. Uh, we do have a number of people living in RVs. Um, as you can see, some of our neighboring cities have a really, really big problem with RVs. Our problem is not 
as big as some of our neighboring communities. Uh, people living in RV, RVs will be eligible uh, for this through through the continuum of care and the coordinated entry system. Um, the there. As far as I know, there won't be storage for the RVs, but there's there's other solutions for that um, that we'll we'll have to work with other community partners. It's uh, have you seen tonight? There's a lot of people that are involved behind the scenes. Uh, we, I think it was uh, you chair that talked about services afterwards and people go to support, permanent support of housing. These services, just so you know, are already happening out like. The services are, are already being delivered like right now without this and will continue all, all the way through. And some of those partners I'm sure will can assist us with solutions for uh, what to do with the RVs for people that enter into the facility. Thank you. Um, do you have any more questions? And one more comment. Hi, uh, Nader Hidari, city engineer. And just wanted to follow up on the uh, comments about the sidewalk. Uh, as everybody's aware, the entire Rancho Conejo area was originally constructed without any uh, sidewalks, and that's kind of how the uh, industrial commercial areas were uh, conceived and, and developed uh, throughout many regions in the, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. In fact, much of this area was built uh, when it was still under the county jurisdiction, and the city annexed the area later. So, um, so it's quite a big lift to you know transform the entire area and put you know, go in and do the surgery after the fact and add a lot of the, uh, these kind of amenities. We are taking steps in that regard. Uh, in fact, we're going to council uh, tomorrow to uh, go ahead with uh, some sidewalk improvements in the Rancho Canaria area uh, that we received uh, state funding for, grant funding, substantial grant funding. Uh, that area, however, is south of Teller. It's, it includes Teller, Hillcrest, and Lawrence Drive, and as well as a pedestrian crossing on Rancho Canejo. Um, so that's a, a nice step in the right direction, and we'll continue to be pursuing grant funding and uh, other means to try to fund additional sidewalk uh, and pedestrian improvements in the area uh, because there is no dedicated funding source for, for new sidewalks. So we're always looking uh, for grant funding, and we've been successful getting similar grant funding for Willow Lane, Caneo School Road, Rancho Road, Westlake Boulevard, and, uh, and Moore Park Road and many other areas, and we're going to continue uh, pursuing that, and hopefully this, you know, the federal infrastructure uh, the package is, uh, has increased some funding to some regard, so we'll continue to pursue that and help uh, improve the area. Thank you. That's good to hear. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? One, one other adjunct comment on the sidewalk question. You might recall that uh, a few months ago you approved the development at 1300 Lawrence Drive. Um, private development is also bringing sidewalk and in, in infrastructure improvements as well. So the project directly across the street as it wraps Lawrence Drive over Corporate Center Drive, they're going to be bringing <coughs> sidewalks and helping complete that portion of that work. So uh, both public and private uh, interests are trying to align to fix deficient sidewalks. Okay. Um, the uh, applicant has five minutes if they want to say anything else. Rick Schrader from Many Mansions. Just in, in answer to one of the questions from a speaker, as one of the conditions is to actually create a website with information about this particular project with a designated phone number and other contact information for anyone that has questions or problems or concerns. Also part of that, part of the good neighbor policy is that there will be a kind of a, a council of stakeholders and neighbors and, and other interested parties that will meet on a regular basis to address any problems that are going on or ways to improve. So I think a lot of this information and contact information uh, will, be, uh, will be established. Thank you. Okay, um, at this point I will close the public meeting and open up the floor for discussion and or a motion. Commissioner Lanson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my time on the Planning Commission, I think I've been asked probably over 100 times, what are you doing about homelessness? Uh, it's the number one question I get asked. It's, it's, and everybody has their opinion. It's amazing how everybody has their different opinion about what they would do. Uh, again, some ridiculous answers, some uh, obviously much more costly. Um, I have to say, this is an impressive project because it actually is a collaboration of amazing people that does something. 
And that is unusual <laughs> in this day and age. Uh, we deal so much, with, we just passed an inclusionary housing ordinance. We're looking at trying to deal with density bonuses to add low, low income housing, but we're not doing a whole lot to actually deal with homelessness. And this is a step. Uh, again, it's not going to obviously solve everything, but to see all of you get together and co coordinate this process, have the best intentions, have the backup of the sheriff, have addressed the neighbor's concerns literally right off the bat, Mr. Schrader, in terms of making sure that website is there. Uh, it just shows all of the effort all of you put in and all how much you care about trying to get this accomplished. And the fact you were able to work with Mr. Colwitz and the staff, and this just, this seems like a perfect synergy of a project uh, that uh, I think is just fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and make the motion. Uh, since we've been here uh, a little bit long. Uh, the Planning Commission adopt a resolution based on the findings and subject to the conditions contained therein to find that the subject is category, the project is categorically exempt from CEQA guideline pursuant to Class 32, Section 15332 and statutorily exempt under Government Code Section 65660B and approve SUP 2023-70013. Thank you. Are there any Commission comments? Commissioner Link. Yeah, I don't think the benefit to the community can be overstated in this regard, and I think I'm most impressed, and I don't know why I haven't seen this before, but the speed at which you can move with these, uh, you know, prefabricated buildings is just, it, it's extremely impressive. I'm, I'm impressed. I, I think it just boils down to that. So I'm, I'm very much in favor and very much in support of this project. Commissioner Ferris. Uh, I'm in support of the motion as well and support all the comments stated here. The one thing I'd add is, is that this isn't merely just a project. It is a set of services with a powerhouse of, of groups who are here to help people who are in need and help them with all the services needed to be able to put them back on their feet and with, with dignity and what I think as a community we should be doing. So thank you all for, for what you're doing and, uh, I'm supportive of the project itself. Commissioner? I am absolutely supportive of the motion, and I'm just so impressed at, the, again, the collaboration here and the fact that, and you, we've got a dream team here. I'm very familiar with Hope of the Mission, and this is, this is a dream team that's been assembled to do this. And just like Thousand Oaks always does, we set the tone, and we want to set the tone for the rest of the state. So once again, we're setting the tone. So thank you. Support the motion. Um, I would agree with everything that's been set up here tonight. I'm very impressed, and <clears throat> to be honest, uh, we all know many mansions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if many mansions is involved, it's going to be a good project. That's just the way it is. So I'm really pleased. Um, at this point, uh, will the secretary please prepare us for a vote? Commissioner Ferris. Yes. Commissioner Tyler Kettlehut. Yes. Commissioner Lanson. Aye. Commissioner Link. Yes. Chair McMahon. Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Um, and thank you all of you for waiting so long for this, uh, this hearing. Um, any aggrieved party who wishes to appeal the Planning Commission's decision may do so by filing an appeal with the Community Development Department within 10 days. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, item number eight, department reports, and there are none. Item number nine, commission comments and AB 1234 reports. Uh, are there any? Any comments from the commissioners? Commissioner Lanson? Uh, thank you, Chair. We uh, attended the Ventura County Housing Conference last week <clears throat> to hear a project, oddly enough, the very project we just voted on, <laughs> uh, and a project in Camarillo, and then heard uh, some of us went to breakout rooms and heard a very uh, heated discussion about rent control, but uh, it's interesting to see how people are moving forward with various issues in terms of housing going forward. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, did you have something? Okay. Ms. Uh, Zelaya, are there any follow-up items, announcements, or upcoming issues? Um, yes. I just, I just want to mention that actually um, there were two other commissioners that attended also at the conference. Mm -hmm. um, that was one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, four items, uh, 10 upcoming issues. Um, on October 24th, 
tomorrow evening, City Council will have the second reading of the inclusionary housing ordinance that was considered by the Planning Commission on October 10th. <laughs> on November 7th, there will be a department report to amend the city's precise plan of design guidelines to allow metal roofs um, as one of the roofs allowed in town and a consent calendar item regarding the acquisition on the, of open space parcel in Arroyo Conejo open space in Costco. Uh, to say into item 10B, items on the upcoming planning commission schedule, there are no items scheduled for November 6th. On November 13th, there will be two public hearings, one for a request for tree removal at 535 Rosario Drive and a public hearing to consider the adoption of a resolution recommending the City Council the adoption of the 2045 General Plan Update, Environmental Impact Report and Statement of Overriding Considerations, as well as the readoption of the 2021-2029 Housing Element Update. And there are currently no items scheduled for December 4th. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, it was a long meeting. Uh, we will now adjourn to the next meeting, November 6, 2023, at 6 p.m.